I've made an effort for you today. I've had to travel across London to my vault, collect something <laughs> just to flex on you. Just flex on your viewers. <laughs> PGE, YouTuber, influencer, and serial entrepreneur. But how many businesses have you got now? I got asked this the other day and I don't think I gave the right answer. It's at least five. Well, this is the crazy thing about it. You used to work a nine to five. And I get people saying, oh, maybe one day, you know, you'll, you'll do well enough and you'll be able to leave your job. And I'm thinking, I could have done that five years ago. And as they say, no risk, no reward. I felt a few times, Tom, you've done it. You've gone under the waves and you're not coming back this time. What is going on, people? Welcome back to the CEO Cast, the number one podcast for showcasing business and entrepreneurship. Now, today, you lot join me on a very special episode, a long awaited episode, someone that I've been trying to get hold of for the start of CEO Cast. And if you understand what he does throughout this episode, you will know why. Today, I'm with Tom Exton, also known as TGE, and the founder. Do you know what? I'm not even going to list it because he's got so many businesses, a proper serial entrepreneur. So I thought it's proper, proper good that we get you on. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me. Apologies, it's taken, what, <laughs> two years to yeah. try and. Try and heard me. Yeah, do you know what? I was, I was looking through my channel last night and I was trying to go through like people, because generally people come on, yeah, and you know, they come on for their specific business. But then you've got so many. And so what I usually do for podcasts is I try and tailor the venue to where we're doing it, like, you know, try and design it towards the business. Yeah. And then when it came across with you, I was like, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, we have a problem. Your because- platform, mate. Swear as much as you want. <laughs> So I thought, okay, no, we have a problem because you've got so many. I don't know whether to do it in a watch dealers or if we do it in a car showroom, if we do it in a gym. I was like, I don't know where to start. So, you know, thank you very much for having us at Joe McCurry. Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't really plan this venue that far in advance. I just yeah. thought, I, I know the guys here really well. It's an amazing venue. You're filming a little vlog here as well, are you not? Yeah, yep. Don't around be around behind the scenes of the podcast as well. I'll probably turn a little video here as well. So, yeah, um, yeah um, cool location. Yeah. Um, and if anyone hears any cars starting in the background, they're doing like some removals and stuff today. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll show chaos. the cars. If you look at the vlog, there's some crazy, crazy cars here. So make sure you check that out as well. But Tom, I want to get into this, right? So if you could name, not name, but how many businesses have you got now? I got asked this the other day. Yeah. I forgot some. Um, and I don't think I gave the right answer. It's at least five. Yeah. But when we say businesses, and I'm sat here, I'm on a, a podcast called CEO Cast. I'm not sat here thinking I'm Bill Gates. You know, it, if I had crushed it and I absolutely understood what I was doing in life yeah. and I really knew what was going on. Yeah. Um, in the nicest place possible way, I, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on an island somewhere. So I'm <laughs> still learning. I'm still trying to grow stuff. I'm messing a lot of stuff up. Yeah. Um, but it's a, at least five different businesses, which I'll, I'm sure I'll bore you lot on no, no, as absolutely. the podcast goes on. See, a lot of people, you know, I think they, they struggle finding the business idea, right? Mm. You have many different businesses. Is it something that you always knew from young that you have to have you know, different sources of income or did someone drill it into you as you were growing up? Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe and set the bell notification to all so you never miss a single episode. Growing up, um, I, I've from like a normal family, not kind of, I never suffered. I was never neglected in any way. You know, mm. there was food on the table. Very, both parents, very, very nice, you know, normal upbringing. Um, but I was taught from early doors um, to just earn money. I think one of the earliest things I remember was my parents saying, you know, po- pocket money's, you know, it's not a thing. You know, you might see your mates getting free money just handed to them, but nowhere in life are you going to get free money handed mm. to you on a plate. It's just, it's just not a concept that we want to drill into you as a kid in your formative years that you can do sod all and get money. Yeah, yeah, yeah Like, what's that teaching you? Yeah, nothing. So from early doors, there was, there was no pocket money. It was like, if you want money, go and work in the local paper shop, go and stuff. You know, the big Sunday papers. I don't know where Sunday papers are even still a thing these days. Everything's digital. Um, are you talking about when people used to come on paper rounds and everything like that? Or So paper round was another thing as well. Yeah. There, there was a churner. Okay, but yeah. in, the, in the Sunday papers, like the Sunday Times used to be about that thick. Okay. Yeah. And there's all the inserts that went in there. And that wasn't uh, an automatic process at the place where it was printed. Yeah, yeah, Every yeah. single estate agent had to... Estate, estate agent? News agent. News agent. Yeah. Estate agent. <laughs> uh, they had to stuff the papers in manually. So they got me and my brother, I think we were like 12, yeah. to sit on the floor for two hours and stuff all these papers in before they went and delivered them and whatever. Um, and that was three quid we got each. But I remember me and my brother getting our three pounds, going home, stuffing in our piggy Three banks. pounds for how long? For like a couple of hours. Bear in mind, but I'm old. old. This was 1924 when we okay, were doing okay, it. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, it was still it was still child labour, yeah, yeah, but yeah. we were keen, and my parents were all for it. And they're like, "Get up at five in the morning, go do go that, do job, yeah. go and get cold, go and get bored, yeah. and earn money." And from that point on, I was like, "Yeah, journey's good, earning money's mm. great," and and that was just normal. So my, you and 
Go on, sorry. And my mum always had like a, a market store job and she's always had little businesses. So she, she, she used to sell like greetings cards, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. She'd always find like some sort of ruse somewhere. She'd get something and sell it on at a market or something. She'd always be churning something. And my dad had a pretty kind of normal, stable job. But yeah. I think when I was in my teens, he lost his job and my mum had to kind of backfill everything. And it was her churning that kind of got got us all through yeah. so um yeah i guess i've always just seen both types of earning as, as normal and wanted to always just do both so for people who know you or people who might not necessarily know you have a twin james right yeah so you, you working with him there's two, two of you which is chaos yeah it is, it's hell <laughs> yeah so i mean two of you working um obviously your business partners with some businesses as well right yeah. have you always been working together throughout your whole life yeah, so we would always be working pretty much in the same jobs. We worked as like lifeguards together at the same swimming pool. Is it all lifeguards as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, MPLQ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, with the, the spine boards and whatnot. I, I, yeah, I can't Chaos. even remember what it was, yeah. Oh, I'll try oh, not to yeah. drown then. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of worked in the same spheres. We, we started our fitness business exactly 10 years ago. In as of the point we're filming this, in about two weeks' time. This is LDNM. Yeah, ten it's, years it's ago, re- reaching its ten-year anniversary. Yeah, it's still That's, still profitable. Yeah. The environment and the landscape has shifted. The yeah. business has undergone changes. We're not still in business with the same people we were at the start. Yeah. Um, but the one true constant is my brother. That's just, so crazy because um, this is where I first come across you from. Yeah, mm. at the very early doors, you were on uh, Paul Wallace's channel. Yeah, this is when you almost had like a Viking beard. Yeah, I was trying big, to grow it as long as I could. <laughs> big guy, blue M3, yeah. which you've got now as well, right? Yeah, I bought it back. Bought it back, and this, so this is where I knew you from. And I think at the time you had LDNM as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How many years ago was that? Because I thought it was about five years ago when I was writing it down last night, but. I think it was probably six, maybe six years ago, something like that. I think it was 2015, 2016. Yeah. Um, it's when I kind of transitioned from being in the background of other people's channels, yeah. mainly Paul Wallace, yeah. big up Paul Wallace, uh, in my blue M3, uh, <sighs> be, being rude, yeah. <laughs> um, to jumping in an F12, heavily on finance. No, a Hurricane and then an F12, yeah. both heavily on finance, <laughs> um, and then trying to start my own my own kind of platform. Oh, so you started your, your platforms with the F12 and the, and the Hurricane? Yeah, I think my first video was, I think it was a Cayman GT4, which I flipped, but I still just collected it on the channel and that and that went pretty well. Yeah. Um, I mean, not only of your businesses, but when you say flip, this is also another one of, you know, I'd, I'd say incomes. Yeah, it, go, it goes through my business. It's yeah. uh, it's an income stream. You know, if I flip a car and make a profit, yeah. it all gets accounted for. Um, and it's part of the business model of, being a car, my business model of yeah. being a car YouTuber, I will try and buy cars that don't lose money. Preferably, they gain value. Whether that's over two years and I enjoy them over that two years and I churn content with them, or it's you know, it has happened two weeks. Yeah. So be it. You how know? how long? What's the longest time you've kept a car for? Uh, I had a Defender for like four years. I've had an F12 for like three years. Uh, that's That went recently. Yeah. So occasionally I will keep them for years. I've had my Carrera GT now for two and a half years. Carrera GT was a solid good buy though, wasn't it? I'm, the, I'm not going to tell you what I paid for it. But yeah, no, we'll get into that or the whole car scene later on. But I just yeah. want to throw it back quickly to LDNM, right? Yeah. That business idea itself, you being into fitness, James being into fitness, where did that business come from? That business started, uh, it was kind of more of a local thing and then it kind of bubbled out from there. James and I used to go to the gym together at the, at the swimming pool where we worked. Yeah. In like uh, outside Southwest London. Did you guys get free membership as well? Uh, yeah, because we worked there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same. Perfect. <laughs> Saving that £20 a month. We were, we were buzzing yeah. with that. Um, and there were two other lads there that we started the business with that were brothers that looked like twins as well, confusingly. Yeah. So there's four of us, although there was only two variations in, in appearance. Yep, yep. Uh, and there was a PT there, an older chap who was ex-marketing at some massive companies that started being a freelance PT because he was sick of it all. And he started a digital business. And he said to us boys, people in the area know who you are. You're the, you're the twins that go to the gym and you other boys are basically, you look like twins. You know, we were known locally, yeah. like the yeah, gym models. around for being the gym guys. He said, I'll build you a website. You should start a blog. Just write down what you're doing in the gym, what you eat, blah, blah, that usual nonsense. Yep. I'll build you a website for free. If you monetize it, which you should, and I'll help you monetize it down the line, and you make a grand, I'll have a grand off you. But if you don't, 
then whatever. So he built us a website and we went into business together, all of us. We had no idea what we were going to do, how we were going to monetize it really. And we released a, a weekly workout for two pounds, a, a chess Sunday two workout. Pounds. Two pounds. And you, people could just, uh, just get an email every single Sunday and they get a chess workout chucked in their inbox. So what Very, was it? Two pounds every week or? Two pounds a week. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, are we, are we, yeah. In this day and age, I mean, you wouldn't do anything for two yeah, pounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, nothing sells for two pounds. A packet of crisps is about 10 of these days. Yeah, a Fredo bar so, costs yeah. uh, two pounds probably. I mean, that is depressing. If yeah, that's true. But back in my days, it was like 5p or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. But yeah. The golden years. Uh, and so it, money started coming in. We would get hundreds of people signing up to this. And we started seeing, you know, thousands of pounds flying around. And we just thought, there's actually a business here. People want digital workouts. And then, bear in mind, this was 2012, 2013. Um, it kind of just snowballed from there. Social media was going crazy. There were, you know, every time you open Instagram and Twitter these days, there's, there's someone on steroids shouting about fitness. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't that, it wasn't that way back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was also kind of a, a sway of people going against the status quo, not wanting to be huge mm. and wanting to actually just be healthy. People that busy didn't necessarily care about the gym. Yeah. I say they weren't yeah. obsessed with it. They were in busy jobs. They did quite well, and they just wanted to know. I'm going on holiday. I'm going to the Maldives with my bird. I want to look. I want, I, I want. want a six pack. Abs. Yeah. And I want slightly bigger arms. Yeah. And I don't really care about the science. Just tell me what to do yeah, yeah, in the yeah. minimal possible way. And and that's how we kind of grew the business. But we kind of resonated with with a lot of people. I was working mm. in the city at the time. I wasn't really a fitness guy per se. I wasn't banging on about it the whole time. Um, and yeah, it just kind of snowballed from there really um, into kind of 70, 80 pound full fat loss plans. Um, and we've we've done hundreds of thousands of those all over the world. This episode is sponsored by Fireway Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK. With over 100 locations, you definitely have a store near you. The founder of Fireway was on the show not too long ago, and you can get a slice of the action by using the discount code CEOCOST at fireway.co.uk. Once again, use the discount code CEOCOST at fireway.co.uk. So that whole element of the business, is that still standing today as in what the core of what you do? Yeah, yeah, we've still got the digital workout plans. Yeah. Uh, as I say, we've sold to like 170 different countries. Yeah. We've done hundreds of thousands thousands of of those plans mm. and it's a it's a beautifully scalable business in that anyone can buy it from anywhere and when they do buy it there's no immediate labor associated with that purchase there's no postage there's no back and forth there's no sales call i can go on my phone right now and get it you can go and get it now and yeah. i wouldn't know yeah it would the money would just hit the account you get on with your plan you would transform your, your body you would cut fat blah yeah. blah blah you'd send me pro progress pictures in sort of three months time mm. and happy days i mean we do offer support so some people will buy it and instantly they'll be on you asking you questions but some people will just take it away it's very easy to understand and they'll just they'll just follow the plan and, and happy days and every single year on the first of january we launch new plans mm. we tweak the previous years we improve elements of it we put all new workouts in and so the first of january every year is just like a massive massive thing for the business so surely it's still not two pounds per plan is it or it's not two pounds per plan yeah. it's about 80 oh. 90 quid so it's about you know an hour or so of an average pt yeah yeah um, that's still solid though isn't it yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's 12 weeks of workouts, your diet, absolutely everything you need yeah. to get in shape. And actually, it's bad business from us because they're so comprehensive and they don't just give you a fish. They teach you how to fish, if that makes sense. Yeah. So actually, once someone's followed a plan once, they don't necessarily come back and get the plan, another plan again. Because they know again, how to do it, yeah. Because they know how to do it. Some yeah. people like the variation. Some people just like just being told, just do this yeah. um, and get all new workouts. But yeah, so it was... It's amazing, really. And we've just transformed thousands and thousands of people. So it's was crazy. this your first business? First proper business, I would say. As well as this, Tom, yeah, this is what fascinates me the most about everything. Being a serial entrepreneur, you used to work a nine to five. I work a nine to five, but it's not, on a, it's remote. So my office is here. Um, it mainly consists of calls bit of spreadsheet stuff yeah emails that kind of thing but i don't need to be anywhere for my nine to five if it was the case where i'd have to go into an office onto a trading floor or any of that kind of stuff anymore i couldn't and wouldn't do it but well, I as, can, in, as in the working side of things yeah the working side of things i wouldn't still be doing it yeah and i in fact i actually left just before covid i quit the whole commuting the commute was killing me for a start it took me best part of an hour door to door each way even mm. though i was within london yeah yeah underground of course. most of the time it's the most inefficient awful time you can't even even 
if you're on a tube, you can't even reach your phone. Even rem- if you don't even have any signal. And even if you did, you can't even reach your phone. See? So, uh, yeah, I remember back in the day following you on Instagram, you used to have a morning snap every single morning of, of you. Like the phone was down here, yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suit, beard, and everything like that. Beard, fuming <laughs> yeah. on the train. Absolutely fuming. On the train, yeah. And I think, that's, I think that was kind of refreshing at the time because most people see influencers and they think, when they were, when most normal people they've got their job they hate their boss yeah. you know they're going on a commute they absolutely hate they're dealing with idiots on the road or the tube or wherever it is every morning yeah. and then you get some smug influencer when you're three hours into your shift clearly just getting out of bed doing whatever the hell they like all day and then getting paid two grand for an Instagram story yeah <laughs> there's nothing relatable about that there's nothing palatable about that it's the most infuriating thing in the world and when I was doing that thing saying. I'm on the tube. I hate everyone as well. I hate everything. Like I'm feeling pretty much exactly the same as you. Yeah. Um, I think that was different in the kind of the influencer world and in the fitness world. And that's why early doors, I I kind of got off to a flying start really. I mean, it was genuine following because you know, Mm. you're genuinely posting your day. What people are probably thinking in their heads, you know, you're not acting like happy days. I love doing this. I love this. And you know, and that's why I followed you as well. You know what? This guy's genuine. This guy's sick. Yeah. and And I still get sick of it as well. And even though I now am technically, an influencer that's the nicest possible way of putting it i can use other words i still see other influencers and i think i don't i'm not sure i want to be a part of this Mm. like there there's so many that incredibly annoying and i'm annoying as well i look back at some of my content and just think i would if i didn't know me i'd want to break my jaw like (laughs) that is that is a very annoying face but it's a very fine line to tread especially in my field now doing all the kind of the luxury stuff like flashy cars flashy watches flashy trips blah 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 yeah you've got to just not be a knob about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like You've imagine. got to realise and appreciate how lucky you are. Mm. And not mo I see some of the people I see moaning about stuff, but influencers, they they moan that, you know, that they've got jet lags and all this kind of but stuff. And you just think just yeah. like read the room. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. No one wants to hear, to hear your, no your serious problems that yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. jet lag from too many trips. Yeah. Or, you know, you're tired because you were editing for 20 minutes earlier mm. in the day. <laughs> or you didn't get a lion. Uh, you had to get out of bed early, for which was then was like eight thirty in the morning. So um, anyway, I'm ranting about influences. That's not what you wanted. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> but, but going back, going back to the question about yeah. you know working, right? For example, yeah. Why do you still do it then? Because you've got all these other businesses, and not just why do you still do it. I'm glad you asked that. Actually, I, I know it's. I know you're. You know, you're technically you can work right now, right? You can mm. work from remotely anywhere. Mm. But it's still probably hard to manage running five businesses, five plus businesses, right? And working, that I can imagine that must be hard because people, you know what it is? People get the concept of, I'm going to start a business to leave my nine to five. Yep. You've got businesses and you still have your job. Yep. So why? I'm very glad you asked that. And I get asked it all the time. And I get people saying, oh, maybe one day, you know, you'll, you'll do well enough and you'll be able to leave your job. And I'm thinking... I could have done that five years ago. So they're referring to monetary. Like, yeah, and they, yeah. They, and they assume because I'm still working, it's because I need the money. Now, I'm lucky enough, my role is, my current role is not exciting at all. It's not, it's not glamorous. It's not flashy. Um, it's not the Wolf of Wall Street, like I think some people assume it is because I'm so yeah, kind Jordan of, Belford and everything, yeah. It is nothing <laughs> like that. It couldn't be more opposite of that. It never has been. Yeah. And it never will be, and it certainly isn't now. Yeah. Um, but when you're self-employed, you often operate through a limited company or you're a sole trader or mm-hmm. you're an LLP and whatever. And when you're starting a business, any startup, you aren't instantly making profits Gosh, yeah. every single year. Yeah. Uh, and even if you are, you'll often just reinvest the money back into the business. Or if you're, especially if you're building a, a business with a, with a company that you're not even intending to sell down the line, because most people only show profit really to, so they can build their valuation and then punt yeah, it. Yeah. But if you're operating out of a kind of just a, a vehicle company, just as a kind of one man band consultancy, for example, something you can't sell like I do, you don't necessarily show loads and loads of profit every single year because you don't need to. You want to put the money back into the business and, and, and grow it yeah, uh, and build up a stock of cash in it or whatever. And that doesn't help when you come to get things like mortgages or in my case, you need car finance yeah, as well. That, yeah. If you want to leverage, lenders will always expect to see a salary or a stable job that they understand. Um, so actually a job for me has been a means to an end. It's enabled me to, I'm on my fourth mortgage now. It's enabled me to buy whatever car I like on finance within reason uh, and actually build an asset base. And actually it's enabled me to 
uh, leverage and actually build my brand on the other side with the money that I'm earning from, from a day job. It just keeps you on the grid. Uh, and most lenders won't look at you unless you've got two years of accounts as well. So that's at least two, two and a half years before you can show them anything, mm. let alone it being probably not particularly appealing in the first two years in, in almost any startup. So do you believe that if you didn't have your job, that it would be harder for you to obtain these things like cars, houses, mortgages, et cetera? Um, Money-wise, the, the job, like, it's, it's not rubbish cash. It's not incredible. Yeah. It's not you know, absolutely bonkers. Would I have all the cars without that job? Absolutely not. Wouldn't be able to afford it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, the jobs, that stable income in the background, whilst also, because any business spikes and troughs, yeah, yeah. I've got the best of both worlds. And it means that I can make decisions for the longevity of my other businesses that aren't necessarily a short-term cash grab because I know I've got stable cash in the background. Yeah. That's what a lot of people as well, I think they're so keen to jump out their nine to five. They jump out too early. They worry about money and then they make short-term cash grab decisions for their business to try and scrabble money in early doors when a lot of businesses would benefit from you actually having an income somewhere else mm -hmm. and actually just making decisions for the, for the longevity of the business as opposed to just trying to get in what you can early doors, yeah, making too many products, yeah. discounting things just to get sales, yeah. just so you can put the put the heating on. You know, and th This is the thing with a lot of people, right? Because they make businesses and they make their profit, leave their jobs, but now their profit is going into their their personal accounts to pay their mortgage or to pay their bills, whatever. Yep. And then their business is not, it's going to die, but mm. it's not going to have that steady, steady growth that they're looking for because they're taking profits out into their personal life to pay for their own things. Yeah. And then you, then you get clobbered on tax on it. And then yep. it's not as rosy as it seems. And yeah, you're right. I mean, when you've got a limited company and whatever, and a load of money comes into it, you think I've made X, but you haven't made anything like that. You've got VAT, you've got corporation tax, you've got your income tax, you've got dividend tax, you've got whatever in it, however it's structured. Yeah. I mean, it's hell. It's actual hell. Like, <laughs> yeah. This country makes it so hard to, to kind of build things and try loads of different things. The paperwork and the rubbish that goes into it all. Uh, I'm sick of it. And going back to your question about how I manage everything, um, I've got great people working with me. Every single business I start, I start with someone that is unbelievable in their field mm -hmm. um, and that can do the stuff that, frankly, I don't have the skills for, let alone the time. So anything techie, haven't got a clue. I'm oh. like a baboon at a laptop. I have absolutely no idea. I can edit on Final Cut Pro yep. um, or something Windows-based of a Windows-based laptop brand when I yeah, yeah, to well. do stuff with them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm partnered with everyone. So it's not me saying, oh, I've got five businesses. I run everything myself. Look at me. I'm a billionaire. Yeah. It's me saying, you know, I, I'm on WhatsApp with these people. Um, and I'm kind of marketing strategies, a very glamorous way of putting it, um, just day in, day out stuff. Um, but the difficult stuff that requires actual skills, I'm always partnering up. So I usually have 50%, 30% of any of these of businesses. businesses. Yeah. But because you're a on social media, you can push those businesses as much as you want. We don't need a marketing budget yeah. because I'm involved. You are the marketer. Yeah. And often I will pull in favors with people that they'll want to work with me on something else. They'll want me to push their business um, so I can drag in favors from influencers and other people and other brands that want to do something completely separate behind the scenes yep. but actually I can tug favours in all over the place so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of glorified networking yeah, really. it's, it's like in a, in a simple way to put it for the audience right it's like you coming on this podcast is doing me a favour you might say to me in the future Raheem can you help me plug storage or LDNNM or something like that. I'll yeah. be like yeah you're not cool you, done, you jumped on the podcast that's coming no nope. <laughs> <laughs> So sponsored by LDNN or whichever businesses you choose. <laughs> I'll find one and shove it through. I'll send you an email. So where do we go from here, Tom? I mean, you, you started LDNM 10 years ago, right? Yep. What was the second business you acquired or you uh, thought of? What was it? I guess like the YouTube stuff. I mean, it is a business. It's yeah. technically a consultancy. You know, I consult brands and I'll, I'll sell them a package of, of media, whether or not I'm filming it, producing it, editing it, presenting it on my own platforms or on their platforms. It is a consultancy, so yeah, I guess that's... You work with some incredible, incredible brands. If no, any other brands really watches uh, podcasts, shout me. <laughs> Holler at your boy. That's it. Come back for 2023. <laughs> no, but you don't, you're, you're so... I mean, if I had to describe you in one way, it's brandable, marketable. How is it that you've achieved that? You know? I've tried. So obviously I started with the car content. I realized early doors that I had this audience of young guys that like fitness. But those young guys, they are aspirational. They're grafters, they're churners, they want nice cars, they like cars. So as soon as I started having enough money to get nice cars, I realized that got loads of engagement mm -hmm. on social media and I realized I could 
make videos and monetize the eyeballs that came to look at the cars. And to an extent, I think me and kind of seeing where, because I've been quite kind of linear online. I didn't start with a load of cash and then kind of I yeah, gradually yeah. got more and more yeah. um, perception wise successful. Yeah, I mean, the first time you came online, you had a blue M3. Mm. So, you which know, is on the lease 500 quid a month it's all the money I had in the world yeah. every single month on the car <laughs> uh, nothing's changed they're still go, all going on cars um, but I don't know what I was going with that but um, I've lost my mind <laughs> you know just being brandable being marketable yeah sorry so, so I start with the car stuff but all the while in the background I've always wanted to be marketable I wanted to be someone that people follow for my journey and what I'm up to I want people to think I'm going to go on Instagram and see what TG's up to rather than Shut up, Tom. Just tell us about the car. Yeah. I don't want to be a car reviewer. There's so many people out there that can stand next to a car, memorize a spec sheet, and say, that's the car. And I don't want to be watched for the car that I'm reviewing. I don't want to be tied into the new BMW 3457i every time it comes out for the rest of my life. Yeah. I don't want to be tied into to just talking about cars and just being a car reviewer because you can do that. And a lot of those people they'll live and die by being the first to get a video out on a, on on a, a certain car. car. Yeah. They'll live and die by their editing, their cinematography, their, their producers, their, all this kind of stuff that goes with it. And to me, there's no personal buy-in at that point. You've not really got much value to an audience and to brands if you are just a vessel for relating, you're just, just someone, relaying a car. Yeah, you're, you're basically- The part car's of the, the star, you're not. Yeah. And you're part of the that brand's PR team. You are, yeah. And whilst I do a lot of brand work, I work with as many brands as I can that yeah. are, are cool and, and kind of relevant to my audience. I don't want to be someone that's literally just a mouthpiece for a vehicle. Yeah. Um, so, and, and it's easier to get numbers, followers, views, if you're niche and you're just a car person. Yeah. You know, you run up to the camera, five things you didn't know about whatever the hell it is this week. Yeah, yeah. You could, I can make reels like that so the, the cows come home. But then when a brand comes to your page, you know, Amiga turn up on your page uh, and they want to work with you and then you Speedmaster. Yeah. They look at you going, five things you didn't know about a Bugatti <laughs> exhaust. Yeah. They just think, do you know what, mate? Enough's enough. Absolutely not. Especially if you're doesn't fit a out. bloke of a certain age in my field, yeah. it's so saturated. Yeah. You're not cutting through the noise. You're just adding to the noise. And my growth suffered because I've tried to be a bit more lifestyle. That sounds awful, yeah. but you know, lifestyle is a cringe term. But I want to be more lifestyle, more about me, what I'm up to, my dogs, messing around with, with my girlfriend, it's, it's, it's vlog, watches, it? it's life. travel. Yeah. And then, which is the ultimate goal, I can then turn having a nice life into a job then you really are just messing around for a living and that's ultimately where i want to take it all yeah but then arguably on the flip side of things i mean i can think of a couple of car youtubers you were describing for example that wasn't a specific go no no, 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 no. there's loads of them pick one <laughs> there's there's loads but i can argue that they're in they're in top positions mm. um I, and i can imagine at their scale at their where they are they're not just getting the cars viewed first time but they might i don't know you tell me they might be getting paid to do that from let's just say bmw the big dogs yeah the, there's a there's probably i would say maybe five not even 10 in the world yeah that they make so much money from that adsense that running around making you know easy peasy five things you didn't know about this car or i chopped the roof off my car that kind of thing yeah. those guys are making you know easy peasy on a bad week six figures just so so just yeah. like literally out of AdSense and, and churning brand deals. So there is money in that and that's not my way of saying it. But my level, I think I'm too much of a Marmite character to ever get to that level. Mm. And it's not where my interest lies. It's not what I want to do with my life. Um, I'm never going to make that money out of making that content. And it's not what I want to do with myself. So um, the majority of people though that try that content uh, and spend their days making horrible stuff, they're not making money like that. You know, for, for example, someone like Shmi in the UK, yeah. um, he absolutely has it off. He does so, so well. He works so hard. Is his content the kind of thing that I would necessarily watch? Probably not. I don't really watch so much YouTube, um, but it works for him. You know, his business model, his AdSense that he will make from his channel, he gets millions of views a month. Unlike me, that gets, you know, seven views a month. Yeah. He, he gets millions and that's his business model and it works really well for him. He likes flying around the world and just documenting cars. Yep. Whereas I wouldn't like doing that. Um, so yeah, by, by all means, it does, it's not it's not rubbish for everyone. But if I try to replicate what Shmi does, a I'd be extremely unhappy. B I wouldn't be able to manage it. 
something extremely disorganized it just yeah. wouldn't work <laughs> i'd end up in you know in the middle of the desert with do, do no that cars, stuff, yeah. without water they would just come back from gumball 3000 in dubai and you know vlogging every day pretty much there for me was yeah was and, and things like that i guess there's some of this stuff that people think oh you know that i'd love to do that and actually i look at that and think that looks like hell i'd rather slam my face in a door mm. unless it was my own rally and you know i was making money off entry sponsors blah 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 yeah you, I would say you couldn't pay me to go on it, but you could. Well, you do have your own rally though, don't you? I did. I've sacked it off now. Is um, it? Yeah, we had a... Is there something you want to say on camera or off? Um, no, I just I just parted ways. The, the business worked. Mm. Um, but I, you know, sometimes in business you don't always... Um, not gel. I get is, on is with... Is this multiple? I, yeah. yeah. I, get it, I get on with John. Yeah. Um, but just... What is it? Don't about, like okay. not, we not, didn't fall out, but not specifically with, with Modball, right? Yeah. But what is it about a business? Because I can imagine, you know, you've you started businesses, exited businesses, sold businesses. What is it about the business that gets to that point where you think, all right, cool, now's that time to make that decision? Uh, I've never been in a position where I've been able to exit a business um, for proper money, mm. not managed it yet. Um, there's a there's a few things bubbling at the moment what I think that might happen in 2023 and I'll start making some needle moving money yeah because um, I've always said it's it's relatively it's not easy to make money but it's making money and getting wealthy getting rich there's huge jumps on from each other as far as far as I'm concerned I've always been okay with making money if you chopped four of the things that I was doing that that made some money I'd find four more things that made some money yep but in terms of making those millions and that big bulk that you think, right, I can chill. And exiting, exiting a business is the main way people do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm yet to get there or, and work out how to get out. Um, so yeah, man, check in so, <laughs> later so next that, year. <laughs> so that switch from making money to being wealthy, is that something you're going to work on next year? Yeah, I need to make generational wealth rather than just making a fair bit of cash. I need to work on that, you know, that next stage because I want to be done. I wanted to be retire by 30. I've yeah. overshot the runway on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to retire by 35. That's not going to happen. Um, so if I can retire by 40 and just have some passive income, you know, a few properties that are being rented out, um, a couple of businesses sort of bubbling away that maybe I've sold out of and still have a, yeah. a little share in. So how um, do you plan to do all that days. then? Um, I'm building a few brands at the moment. I've got a couple of really cool competition businesses. I know it's quite a saturated area, um, but we've got a really nice one called Classic Giveaways, which we basically are fully immersed in the in the Porsche cult, which is just manual Porsches of all ages. People yeah. love them. People are always going to love them. And it's a it's an amazing brand that I personally love. I work with at a brand level. Um, so that's building really nicely behind the scenes. We've just taken on a new uh, marketing person there. Um, we've done a little equity shift around, um, and so the growth plans are really exciting. We've got a we've got a path that we can follow with that. That's why specifically in that classic giveaways because, like you said, it's saturated where a lot of people are doing giveaways. I see people giving away you know small cars like, for example, your Sports One series M One Forty Is, or yep. you know you got the other likes doing supercars or yeah uh, watches, which you also do as well. We'll get into that in a second. But why specifically classic cars? The market isn't as big. Uh, it's a harder sell. I appreciate that. But my audience love them. I love them. And it's also, it's a niche that hasn't been exploited. Some people are doing classic cars now, mm -hmm. um, but no one's smashing the Porsche thing. Um, and I just think it's a really nice niche to be in. My business partner actually gives away classic minis. He just does minis. And he gives away... Oh, you talk about like the, like the Mr. Bean minis? The Mr. Bean minis. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the way I describe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think he'd appreciate what I call them Mr. Bean minis, but those minis, but the, the proper minis, yeah, not yeah, the yeah. massive BMW yeah, yeah, yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, and he, he gives away one of those a week. It's extremely, it's extremely popular. It's extremely lucrative. Yeah, people love the, them. The winners are happy. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great business. And he's my business partner with classic giveaways. He understands the business back to front. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a marketing guy that works in that field already, giving cars away. Um, so our first competition goes live uh, this Friday, which uh, God knows when this is going to go out. It's a 996. It's probably over by the time yeah. this goes but out. You, you've got giveaways going out every week, am I right? Yeah, the aim will be to do every single week. We're going to yeah. see how this sort of relaunched competition goes because we, we took a hiatus um, over the summer months just to yeah. kind of restructure things. 
Um, we'll what? see how it goes. I'm sure by this point, another uh, car, you'll be giving away another car, right? So you people can click up here on the top left, check out the website, see what's being given away at the moment. Or I'm pretty sure you would advertise it on the channel saying that you got a new car and then realise it's a giveaway and stuff as well. <laughs> I would never do that. I would definitely do that. That's all I do. Um, so yeah, that that's really exciting. And, you know, at the point at which you're doing a car a week, you know, you've got a really, really good business there. Yeah. And those competition businesses, there's been a few that have been bought recently. Yeah. Um, you know, the aim would be to scale it for a year and then put it out on the market. Who buys these? Like Competition you, businesses? Yeah. I should know. Research didn't go that far. <laughs> but I do, I know people in the industry and they basically, I kind of know what people have been bought out yeah. for. And it's, it's, the, yeah, the multiples of turnover are mental. I mean, from what I've heard, I was speaking to someone about, I can't remember, I was speaking about a year ago. We were speaking about someone else's competition business specifically, whether it's been bought out or not. And I was asking, why were people bought out of these businesses? And they were saying purely because of the data they accumulate from people. The data is huge. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a massive, massive part of it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm doing that with classic giveaways. And you touched on watches. I've also got a watch business as well. We've yeah. got the same marketing guy across that that's also across the classic minis side as well. So he's across three competition businesses. Yeah. Obviously there's going to be elements, learning points from all of them. The watch market is slightly different to the, the car giving away market. Yeah. What's different there? Um, we've started with higher ticket prices on the watches with, with lower ticket numbers. Yeah. Um, because it's, a, I feel it's a slightly different audience potentially. Um, but we may change that by the time this video goes out, we may have changed that. We're going to experiment and see what works because there's very definitely a, a happy medium. So give me an example. When you first launched that business, what watch did you have and what was the price for the ticket? We first launched that business, I think it was with a green Submariner maybe. Okay, we went yeah. in pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, and I think tickets were about 40, 50 quid. But there was only a few hundred of them. Mm. So obviously, and it's one of those businesses, unlike most things, you don't know how much money people are making. You can't hide from the fact that, you know, this watch you're is making yeah. double what the watch you probably paid for. Yeah. Um, we're quite lucky we get the watches in the trade. So we get we buy in quite nicely. Yeah. Um, and I actually got blacklisted by a authorised dealer, watch authorised dealer, because I had an interest in a competition business. Even though I'd never get... I've still got all my own watches. I've never flipped any watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've still got all my watches that I bought from that dealer. But they said it's come from HQ. Someone obviously has got salty yeah, at yeah, HQ. Yeah. They're going, yeah. oh, saw your YouTube videos. TG has got a Lambo. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. So they've just stuck, the, stuck their knife in. Um, and yeah, I don't get any so st you, steel Rolexes anymore. So you can't get any Rolexes for nope. yourself? Nope. So so where do you get your Rolex? Do you have to go reseller now? I don't buy them anymore. I don't buy Rolex anymore. Purely because of that reason? Yeah. I had a really great relationship with a dealer. Yeah. Um, I got a Pepsi, Hulk, all sorts of stuff. I've still got them. Yeah. I don't really wear them. I, I'm not hugely keen on them anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they just said, Was yes. that a main Rolex dealer? Okay. Uh, it's not Rolex themselves, but I think, yeah, they made Someone up some big cock basically. and ball about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had to explain, you know, look at all the competitions that have happened. None of them have ever been pieces that you've allocated me. Yeah. If you want me to come in with all the Rolexes you've ever allocated me and all the bits and some of the I weird prove to you that you still have everything. Yeah. yeah, I used to buy like watches that I like that weren't flippable. Just what like but something that you like. Yeah. Sodom. If you're watching yeah. this, Sodom. <laughs> What's your favorite watch then? Because um, you've got a vast collection of watches, right? Yeah. I've seen you've got loads of Amigas. I saw one on your. YouTube video, I believe. You had a Harrods Tudor, yeah. which I really want to get. Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to yeah. get hold of them, but I can't find them at the moment. But yeah, you've got- Just a ask them. Collection. They're still making them. Yeah. Just ask them for the Harrods I've been Tudor. to a couple of shops. Like I went to the ones, ones in Dubai, I went to a couple in London. None of them have them. Uh, yeah, you can only get them in Harrods. Clues in the- uh... <laughs> <laughs> Get to Harrods. That. <laughs> That'd be a good start. <laughs> yeah, pop in there. Um, I've still got mine. Yeah. I'll send it to you for loads. No, I'm joking. Yeah. I'm keeping it. But um, my favorite watch- that I don't have. I like the Richard Mill, Cyril Congo, you know, I'm a paint through and all over it. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. think it's sick. Uh, favorite watch that I've got. It's a typical one, actually. I've got an old Patek Aquanaut. Yeah. But yeah, the watches are a weird one because I know I've got a collection, but I can't get them insured on any form of residential property. So I've made an effort for you today. I've gone, I've had to travel across London to my vault, collect something <laughs> just to flex on you, just flex on your viewers. Um, but I can't get insurance. Yeah. Um, Why is that? Because the value of the collection yeah. 
I need to put some of them in a vault. So I may as well just put all of them in a vault. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, it's just in a bonded unit. Yeah. And I don't see them. They're, it's basically just, you know how people have like crazy art? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is depressing because you can't appreciate them. them. Yeah. But, you know, once I come out of here, this is going in my pocket. I'm going straight back to, to the vault. Point there. And that's that. Yeah. And so you can't wear it on a daily basis efficiently. No. So they're yeah. a bit of a waste of time. But I, it's nice knowing I have them. Should I have sold them all probably six months ago? Potentially. Yeah, because the watch market's crashed now, isn't it? Well, not crashed, but it's on the downfall at the moment. It's come off a bit, yeah. yeah. Your, your mass production, still in production, still overhyped stuff has yeah. come down, which was it was always going to happen. Have all your watches been from AD? Uh, no, I bought loads grey. Loads yeah. of grey market, yeah. This was actually from AP House. Okay, yeah. Uh, on Bond Street. Probably one of the only watch dealers I've dealt with, like a main dealer, that are just nice, normal humans. Um, they're just a great bunch. A lot of dealers I've dealt with, even in the car sphere, some of them are just robotic. Robotic at best. Yeah. Some of them just have lost that. I think where we've had a few boom years, they've lost that ability to just uh, treat people like normal humans mm -hmm. and just like reply to things and just not red carpet treatment, just basic decency. Yeah. A lot of that's fallen out of, of the luxury sphere, which is mad. You go and buy a golf, which I did um, a few years back. I've never been treated so well in my life. VW Golf but then if you go and buy a high end car I'm not going to name any brands you buy it and they just they forget you exist they're like who are you I've never seen you before it's really crazy actually you'd think it'd be the other way around but it's not yeah I thought, it, I thought it would be like especially with the high end brands whether it be watch or whether it be cars once you buy a car directly from the dealership or AD per se yeah. they'd be like oh TG you're back in like let's just say you're going for a quick pop in visit to your high end dealership mm. where you've previously bought one of these cars from well these guys are great i mean they they let me yeah, i mean yeah, today yeah. we've just strolled in with podcast yeah. equipment i gave them about five minutes notice and they're like yeah go sit upstairs it's fine <laughs> yeah. so guys like joe mccurry but the main dealers that you know the yeah yeah that ones where the actual cars are being manufactured yeah, and stuff yeah i mean you'd think that it's an arrogance that comes with working directly for the brand i think yeah uh, and uh, you know if we do go through a bit of a downturn and, and they'll have to start learning how to sell things again um, then you know that might be one of the positives, and so they're going to start being nice to customers yeah. again. This is interesting, right? I'm I'm not going to name the brand on camera, but just to give you just to give you some reference, right? There's uh, yeah. there's brands there where you've bought cars from from the main dealer. Have they allocated you anything special in the future, or have they forgotten about you in that sense? Uh, so Porsche Reading have I bought a Turbo S off them, and I bought loads of Porsche over the years, but Porsche Reading have actually allocated me a gt3 my first gt product is it um yeah a gt3 touring which lands take it yep. yep yeah yeah i've got it well i don't have it yet I, it's i think it's at the port now so yeah. by the time this video goes out it'll be on my channel probably been driven around knightsbridge yeah <laughs> um so that's been the first time that the best know, place to buy uh, drive your supercars in knightsbridge perfect yeah especially great your roads, gt3 good track isn't it? it's long street <laughs> Yeah, get a, get a flex on people in traffic. Yeah. Get your window broken. Your watch nicked. <laughs> it's lovely, really nice. Um, you must have seen that video of the Bugatti getting yeah, smashed with the watch. I mean, I've yeah. sent that about a billion times. Yeah, 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 it's, just, it's a joke. Yeah. London's hell. Um, so I'll probably keep that out in the country. Yeah, but with um, so the brand I'm thinking of, I won't say it on camera. It's Ferrari. Mm. So would they have offered you anything higher level? As opposed to like the P stuff, for example. Yeah, so I got the P stuff because I bought an F12 from the dealership. I bought a Lusso. Well, I bought the Lusso and the P stuff on the same day. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Um, which is a massive chunk of car finance, I'll tell you that. Why did um, you get both on the same day? Um, I had to buy one to get the other. And Ferrari actually blacklisted me for putting that in a video. What, the fact that you got both? Yeah. Why? I said <laughs> I, I didn't get my P stuff. Unless I bought some X demo Lusso that I didn't want. Oh, that's crazy. Um, and I literally sent a truck to collect the Lusso and took it straight to another dealer just to sell it. No. <laughs> and but that's the only way you could get your pista. Yeah, and everyone there knew that I was going to do that. Yeah. They said, if you do that with a pista, you're in a lot of trouble. But you do that with Lusso, we don't care. Yeah. We can't sell them for love nor money. Do what you want. Yeah. Um, and that was a 200 and 220 grand car that I didn't want that I bought to get my pista. How much was your piece stuff? You don't mind me asking? Three thirty. That was a six six spec. It was, yeah. I should have kept it to be honest. You sold that. If I remember watching the video, someone in Malaysia bought it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of, because of the way I buy my cars, they stay VAT qualifying. Yeah. So I can export them at yeah. any point if I want to. Yeah. And the market at that point had nosedived a bit on the pistas so I went to Malaysia and obviously it's Malaysian colours yeah. unless I'm being deeply offensive and it's actually not. It is, isn't it? Blue I think and it yellow. Is. I think it is. Blue and yellow Malaysia. 
get away I'm with that. Sure, yeah. Or people like Sweden, Ikea, like, no, <laughs> yeah, Malaysia. Yeah. Um, so that's batting around, uh, yeah, somewhere, somewhere in Malaysia. Malaysia. Yeah, Qu- Kuala Lumpur. So did you make money on it or did you lose money on it? I lost money. Oh, is it? Yeah, I lost money. Uh, I think it went for 315, 320 in the end, and I bought it for 330 at oh, a year it, and a yeah. half. So not the end of the world. Yeah, not too bad. No. That's something now. Um, I think they're still about th- they're still about the same money actually. Yeah, but fair. they did dip a lot. They went down to about two fifty in the trade uh, during COVID, that yep. first wobble. Yeah, uh, and I kind of got out at the start of that. So, you know, sometimes you know I don't have a bottomless pit of cash. Sometimes it's it's good to just release some money, even if it's not the best money you could potentially get if you waited another three months. Sometimes that cash going back in the pot allows you to move forward the next step and make more. Yeah, uh, I mean in that time frame, almost half of your car collection you could say are. Really good investments, you know. For example, the main one, obviously, being in my opinion, the the Carrera GT. Yeah. Right. That was amazing because I remember even myself looking at Auto Trader, even though I didn't have the cash to go and buy it. I remember looking at Auto Trader when they were about two hundred, two twenty. Mm-hmm. I think I sold them last night for about seven, eight hundred around that region. Yeah, I mean that would be a. What the, there's none in the UK for that, is there? I'll go and, I'll go and burn it to the ground. I don't think so. I don't know if it's seven, eight hundred. How much? How much are they? <laughs> Uh, I've only seen them over a mil now for the past year. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some like... Um, oh, I say they're going up even more. Yeah, some kind of snotters in Europe, kind of ex crash ones. There's a few that have done like sort of 56,000 miles. They've had a crash, they've been put back together and there'll be a sub a million. But any any clean car is well over a mil now. That is crazy. Mm. I've been offered 1.15 for mine. Would you ever sell it? Um, I want to be in a financial position where I never need to sell it. I can just keep it long yeah. term. Um, hopefully that's the case. If I make as much as I want to, then I'll just hold on to the thing. Um, but it's nice to know that, you know, within the next three to five years, there should be a couple of million quid sat there. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll- then you would have made your money pretty much like, I mean, I don't know what you bought it for, but I'd say at least five times over. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, which is mental. Yeah. But then all your other cars as well. I mean, I remember everyone used to ask you, where's your M4 DTM gone? Stuff like that. Like. Yeah, I just got rid of it straight away. Do you know what? It landed, I drove it, and I thought, I actually don't like this. I don't have to hold on to it. Yeah. Someone's offering me 20 grand over. See you later. Yeah. And why is it that people get loads of, like, upset about flipping cars? Because it's rarely the people that are in the market for them. It's people that aren't in the market for them, but just... I think there's there's a different thought process. And I'm not saying, oh, if you don't have the money, you don't understand. That's not what I'm saying. If Once you're in a position that you've chucked... 150 grand into something 100 grand of it being finance it's a, it alters your mindset on these things slightly yeah um and you know maybe five ten years ago before i was doing this if i saw people getting allocations on like my dream car and then just hoofing them to make 50 grand or 100 grand i think you're a sod you've clearly got more money than god yeah. like, why do you need an extra 50 yeah and realistically a lot of the people that are buying these gt3s and whatnot you know they can make 80 100 grand overnight and tax free as well not for me. I put them through my business so that they're not tax free and I do have to account for them. But people that buy cars personally, yeah. if you went and bought a GT3 tomorrow for list, yeah. 150 grand, you could sell it the next day for 220 quite happily. Tax right? free. And it'd be tax free. How? No capital gains, nothing. It's a, it, it doesn't apply to cars in a personal Does it capacity. Not? Nope. And I know. I know and there's some, no limit to that. There is no limit to that. Single seater race cars, I think, are subject to capital gains tax. Yeah. But your passenger cars, your road cars, no tax. So hypothetically, unless you buy them in the course of a business, you know, if you're if you're buying them with your business and you're using them for business purposes, yeah, and you sell them, you make a profit. Yeah, you have to account for that. And you have yeah. to pay tax yeah, yeah, yeah. and do whatever. Um, but as a, as John Smith on the street, you make hundred grand tomorrow on a car. Forget it. You don't need to sell the revenue. It's not income. That's it's crazy. Just, I didn't know that. Mm. that's probably why a lot of people are doing it like you know if I was in a position where I could buy a GT3 yeah yeah, and and even if it was my dream car yeah unless it was a one of one and someone offered me a hundred grand over it mate take it bye on your way ciao yeah, I've got a hundred grand extra Toodle pip I could buy another one and Go still and have a hundred grand yeah or wait six months wait for them to drop and, and you know yeah. still keep it 50 makes grand sense. in your bank it makes sense to me like and, and that was my point you know the average person buying a GT3 150 grand you know they're probably earning oh, I don't know I'm just going to make a figure up that's probably going to annoy people now maybe they're making 150 grand a year mm. pre-tax yeah. right and you can easily buy a GT3 on earning that money right because it's yeah. it's going to cost you 800 pounds a month put 20 grand down yeah. most people without proper responsibilities only 150 grand a year yeah, can do yeah. that yeah 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 um, so when you get offered a hundred grand over, that is more than you earn after tax every year or around the same, literally for doing nothing. You can see why a lot of people take it. So I don't 
hate anyone that flips. I don't hate no. them. You never know what's going on in people's lives. Some people, you know, they have illness, they have to take time off work, you know, they've got sick family, they've got other things, you know, that money might go towards helping their parents out with a mortgage deposit. You don't know what's going on in people's lives to start a new business. That 50 grand to you doesn't mean the same as 50 grand means to someone else. Everyone's mindset is different and that can differ even on different days of the week. So yeah. I never judge. I do know someone that put money, he spent about one and a half mil on a car. I believe there was some sort of uh, remortgage that went on with the house to, to get the money together to buy this car yeah. uh, and within five years he flipped it for over 20 million quid 20 million quid what car was it? that will give the game away but it gives it gives you an idea and it wasn't 20 million quid it was it's a different figure yeah it's more but it gives you an idea how long ago was like did he buy the car? Um, he bought it. it this has happened in the past decade okay yeah yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go specific because I don't want to but there's no tax liability on that whatsoever. There's there's nothing. So he's he's cleared, he cleared like 20, twenty mil. Yeah, and, and no tax. So if the law does change on it, yeah. it's probably due to that one car. That, I can't even think about what car would like. I'm not even going to think because my brain's just going to hurt. <laughs> Get in the comments. <laughs> Get in the comments. Let us know where it is. It wasn't me though. Again, wouldn't be sat here. I love this, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sat here. You would have bought your own private island. Yeah, yeah. I'll be on there with no social media. Yeah. I'd have disappeared completely. Tom, I'm going to throw it back to business, yeah? Yep. Early doors on CEO Cast. You were actually on this channel. I don't know if I've sent you this video or not. Um, it was back at Autosport when you launched Storage. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, that. You yeah. had that was when you had your 488 P star, mm. and I remember you had the matching um, the storage yeah. cabinet to, to go with it. So, what made you come up with that business? And more so, what I want to ask is, where do you get your business ideas from? And the reason why I ask is because I think everyone who watches this podcast, they've either got a business or they want to start a business. And if mm. they want to start a business, they always think, what business do I start? And we're in a day and age where there's businesses about anything and everything, so you can't even reinvent the wheel so much. You could just add your flavour to it. Yeah. So, where do you think of your business ideas? That particular one, the storage unit, for those that really want boring, um, it's spelt storage, S-T-O-R-I-J, and it's effectively just a big cabinet on stilts. Yep. The idea is that someone's got their garage or parking space that wants some storage space in their house. They don't want to rent a big yellow self-storage unit yeah, yeah, off-site yeah. and they've got to go and drive to it. Yeah. They can literally park their car with the bonnet goes underneath this unit and the box sits basically above the bonnet of the car. Um, and I wanted that for me. I had all these parking spaces, all these bloody cars, and far too much crap, actually, that comes with them. You know, your spare exhaust, your airbox, your winter tyres, whatever it is, yeah. you know, your car covers, your chargers, whatever it is. And sometimes um, you don't just want to leave it on the floor in your parking space because it gets covered in crap. People steal stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I wanted somewhere to put that stuff. And then I was like, well, actually, I've got suitcases and whatever bulky crap lying around in my apartment, my house. Put that, it there. Yeah, and I've got, you know two by four meters squared that's literally just got a car in it but you own the air above it yeah, yeah you yeah. have the space above the, the car. whole thing isn't yeah, it you've got all of and it whereas if you've got a supercar i mean that's yeah you could probably fit two more cars on top of that supercars in that way so yeah. you've got a lot of space got loads of space so i just thought do you know what um let's see if it's out there and i managed to find somewhere that would do something similar I'll tweak the design and i thought i'd launch it at autosport actually although we launched it with a supercar it's not really aimed at supercar people Mm. It's aimed at people that have apartments, kids, skis, bikes, Anything, bags. any car. Just any car at all. Yeah. And we made it height adjustable so you can stick a Range Rover underneath it. Oh, is it? We actually test it with a, my Defender, which has got like the highest bonnet pretty much of anything you can buy. Yeah. Give, give or take. So is that business still going then? So we packed it up and paused it. Yeah. Um, we There was three of us in the business and one of the guys in the business, um, let's just say he wasn't particularly... Um, but there was communication issues between all three of us. We were all to blame. And the price of steel went through the roof and we were actually importing them from the Far East. Uh, COVID ruined everything. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a load of the stuff that we bought from the supply arrived damaged. We had problems with the place we were storing, the flat packed units. You name it, everything went wrong in the chain. And I thought, I don't need this headache. We've sold a couple. We've come out flat. Um, I've got no skin in the game anymore. I don't care. I need to just put my time into other stuff. And we kind of just put it on hiatus. Fast forward now, though, I actually did a deal with GoDaddy, Is it? advertising that business and advertising the website because the website was built with GoDaddy. Yeah. Double churn, we call that. So wait, hold on. So you, so setting up the business, you built the web website on GoDaddy. Yep. Yeah. Did you, 
So how did this all go around? Did you then reach out to GoDaddy to say- So GoDaddy wanted to work with me anyway because they wanted, they like the whole small business thing and you yeah. know, my, a lot of my audience love small business and they're yeah. building their own websites and blah, 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 and whatever. Um, and my business partner actually built the website with GoDaddy. So I was like, actually, my business partner built this thing with, with GoDaddy. Like, do you- We'll just use that to- Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I can ha I can talk about that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really know how to build a website. Yeah. Um, and also Squarespace are fantastic. I prefer Squarespace. They're much better. How do, who, how do you get these brand deals? And I'm asking for myself main, mainly because I see all these brand deals like Squarespace, GoDaddy, Wix. Let's not forget any of them. There's <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> I've got loads of time. Um, but all these brand deals, right? How yeah. do you go about getting them? A lot of them reach out to me. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes I'll see a brand working with uh, a creator that has a similar audience to me. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll reach out. I'll be like, hey guys, you know, my audience would love what you do. You're clearly trying to reach these sorts of people. Um, I've got a load of great eyeballs, mainly just rich blokes and blokes that want to be rich and blokes that are somewhere between being rich and start and trying yeah, to be yeah, rich. Yeah. You know, aspirational, they like nice things. Mm, Holler well, your boy. <clears throat> like I said, my audience do tend to love building websites and, um, you know, they do like business. Squarespace, <laughs> holler. <laughs> I put, mate, I'll put you in touch. I'll put you in touch with the guys that, that work with them because... They've, I've just renewed for a third year with Squarespace and they're great. My audience use my code hand over fist. You know, these brands don't extend these deals yeah. if it's not relevant to your audience. If your audience don't care and they don't click the link and they're not signing up, then the, the brands can see it. They track everything. Yeah, yeah. So if it doesn't work, they don't come back. Yeah, I mean, they sign for a third year. So yeah. Do you think with the, with the quality of the brands that you work with, also other brands look at that quality and be like, okay, cool. He's working with eBay, for example. Definitely, yeah. The, yeah. These days, yeah. And it hasn't always been the case. I think in the past two, three years, it's really picked up. But when I did that Harrods campaign, I had... Um, that was just Instagram, isn't it? Yeah, Instagram and Facebook. And they ran a load, yeah. like a nationwide like advertising campaign with that. And they put oh, loads it? of usage behind it. Yeah. Um, absolutely loved working with them. It was kind of a dream campaign, really. Um, and then the Porsche stuff. I had brands like, um, well, Amiga, I'd worked with them before. But Creed, you know, like really nice brands were suddenly in my inbox. You know, Tag Heuer um, and some other, some other people I don't want to throw in at this point. But yeah. that came off the back of the Harris thing. That's crazy. I assume, because it kind of got, Sort of, there was a little spike around Recognition that. So, around. Yeah, very definitely yeah. brand alignment. Yeah. But if you start punting out terrible watch brand ads, yeah, you can do a cash grab. But would then IWC come in and go, "We want to work with you because we've seen you working with X person, yeah, whatever, you know." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's that's what I'm saying. For next year, I really want to focus on the brand deals. Not even, do you know, what? it's not even about the money, but it's got to be relevant towards what I do. And for example, whether it be an e-bank websites or. Uh, Anything business related, for example, yeah. then I'd let, like I'm all for it. Basically, do you need a team to help you run that sort of I've stuff? I've got someone who helps me, Mahmood. Yeah, Mr. Mahmood Ansari, big up. Um, we just work together basically. Um, he does some outreach to brands. Sometimes brands will will reach out and they just want a, a million emails before they kind of get going with anything. And he just helps me with that that traffic. He does the invoicing. You know, sometimes if if it helps to go and meet a brand for coffee and discuss things and I'm not around rather than saying, I'll see you in three weeks, I'm busy. Mm. Um, he can go and meet them. Um, and he's got a great contacts, but he, he's worked in the industry for years. He was at Drive Tribe before. Um, and he's oh, was just, at Drive Tribe, was he? Yeah, he was at oh. Drive Tribe. And we started working together then. I was kind of their hired, uh, their hired gob for a load of their kind of commercial partnerships. Yeah. And he said, do you have anyone representing you? And I explained that I hadn't signed with an agency. Yeah. Like everyone that does what I do, they've all got a, an agency they're signed with. Uh, and I work on a non-exclusive basis with about 15, 20 different agencies because um, I won't sign exclusive with anyone. Yeah. Because getting off topic a little bit, they if you get a brand deal in for like 1,500 quid, that's a lot of money, right? Yeah. Uh, and after you, you know your agency cut and whatever, it's... 1200 they yeah. typically take like 20 odd percent whatever yeah, yeah, it is something like that um but that agency a lot of the time to make them 300 quid that particular account executive that's you know working for you and five other insta influencers they don't want to spend a week of their time trying to make you 200 uh, trying to make them 200 quid or their firm 200 quid of which they presumably get a performance related cut of that so yeah, yeah, yeah. out of a 1500 quid brand deal someone that's you know not only huge bucks as an account executive, they're not going to want to slave away trying to make themselves maybe 50 quid. You know, so mm. that 1500 quid brand deal, you probably won't even see it come to you because it'll be nipped in the bud 
by your by your agency. Yeah. They won't be that bothered. They'd rather concentrate their time on, you know, five other deals they've got for their other creators that are five, 10, 15 grand deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, yeah. So you lose a lot of business like that. And I've seen it firsthand because I know so many people in the, in the field that I'm in and, and other genres that they don't get thousand two thousand pound deals very often they either get big ones or nothing and i say well yeah it's all very well and good you get bigger ones but you're dropping probably three four deals a week that are 1500 quid or 1200 quid in your pocket yeah that's a churn yeah that's still a lot of that's money an absolute churn yeah. yeah it's like four grand a week yeah yeah, yeah. You're, you're dropping because some agency person can't be bothered now mamoon and i don't work like that we will we will take the brand if it fits and it's moral we'll it. and it's legal yeah Hit it, go again, turn it around, go again, produce results for the clients, bang it out, go again, get a good working relationship with the with the brand that's come in or their agency. And then they'll probably bring you a bigger deal down the line because they trust you with a small one. You've knocked it out of the park, you've over delivered, you've got a load of conversions, you give them all their insights, give them all the conversions, you send it back to them, and they go, These guys are the nuts. Yeah, the thick. We go again, we've yeah. got a 15 grand brand deal, Let's bosh, go. or the yeah. client that you just worked with wants to do more. Yeah. And that's how you do it. Rather than going, 200 quid commission can't be bothered, which is what happened. So I haven't signed with anyone exclusively. Moon and I work together. Um, he will answer emails at three in the morning. Yeah. If we have to jump on a call at four in the morning, we're both up working. We like He's absolutely relentless. I'm relentless. And we've just got a great working relationship. He can be super blunt with me. So he'll say, Tom, you messed that up. Like, sort it out. Yeah. You're late with this. Just like, what are you playing at? You're pissing people off. Yeah. Keep it real with each other. Get on with it. Yeah. I can't keep stringing people along on this deal, that deal, whatever. So yeah, yeah it works really well. And you know, He's bought an Audi R8 off the back of it. You know, he's, he's yeah, got a Q8. He's, yeah. he's, he's doing really well out of it. And, you know, the brands we work with are really happy. Agencies are happy. Everyone's a winner. So, yeah. Maybe just get Mahmood on the podcast as well. That'd be, that'd be a good one. Yeah, get Mahmood in the pot. Yeah. He'll charge you. I'm not, I'm not sure you can afford him for the day. Not that I'm being paid. <laughs> you can pay me if you want. Um, I was going to ask just a quick one off the back yeah. of the brand. Was, have you ever worked with a brand that's, let's just say you've put out the ad and you've had to take it off for whatever reason? I'll give you an example. In my case, yeah. I worked with a brand deal once. It was a, not fintech. It was like a, like a financial platform. They were going in a big, I think, I think you might have done one as well. And, I uh, didn't, I didn't, but I mentioned it when it went out and I, I didn't throw them under the bus, but I came out and I said, I'm not doing it. No, you're talking, I know which one you're talking about. You're talking about blue, blue Bugatti one. You know, I've done this ad yeah. where I had done a deal for them, whatever. And yeah. then I think it was about th three weeks later, I'll get an email saying you need to pull this ad down now. And I can't remember why. Did you I get paid? Yeah, yeah, I got paid, yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah, I made sure the money Even was in better. first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the ad came out and I was just like, that is that is weird. Did you did you snip it out of the video? Did you go on the yeah, YouTube yeah, editor yeah. and just I've drop just it done out? That, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I had to do that with eight videos, six or eight videos. Is it? Yep. What, for and that same? Okay. Not because it was a scam, just because they had... I can't remember that. The exact FCA reason. got upset with something they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a fully legit business, yeah. but the FCA just got a little bit upset with something they did yeah. uh, about influencer marketing because it was going through a like, transitionary period of what you could and couldn't do. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a massive deal on the table with, um, with Binance. Hopefully this doesn't get me in trouble. But like a real kind of... Binance pushed me on Potentially well. like a life-changing deal for the year yeah. obviously they're involved in f1 loads of cool stuff yeah uh, it's aligned with what i was doing and actually that came about because i used binance and but back when everyone was banging on about crypto i had a little bit and yeah. i just kind of <laughs> commentate on the market with a completely <laughs> ignorant mind every single day just yeah. you know oh it's up today they're, yeah, they're yeah. the green today oh it's red today yeah no idea or i've paid i bought some poo coin today let's see what happens <laughs> yeah. um but i'd use binance and binance would be my screenshot whenever i was illustrating anything yeah not not coin pumping literally just Showing. I'm bored in lockdown like everyone just laughing at crypto like yeah, everyone yeah, else yeah. Um, and Binance got hold of this and they, they wanted to work with me and they would do stuff with the Alpine F1 team and there was some stuff on the table that's really really exciting um, but then the landscape changed with how influencers work with financial institutions and exchanges and whatever um, and you know part of that was free trade which fell out of bed um, a little while after that actually yeah. once the Binance thing went to pot I, I then was like fine I'll work with free trade so all the um, the Lannister stuff was this before all of that when was Lannister? But I wasn't particularly popular. I had them on at me. It was because Aleem, when Aleem got his Bugatti. So that was yeah. last year. Last year around this time, I think, maybe. Yeah, and I went and filmed with Aleem and I went in the car, but I didn't do anything about Lannister because I pulled my agreement with them. Yeah. Um, it just, and I'm not saying there's anything untoward there, but it didn't make sense to me. And I was like, I've got to be really careful here. If you, if you, because I have 
pushed it. I've done a lot of ads. And as long as you can always say everything I've advertised is legit, mm -hmm. you will come through it. You'll yeah. be fine. Yeah, of course. And you can demonstrate that you do pick and choose and you say no to some stuff. But if you get it wrong once, you just you destroy your reputation. So I was like, I, this doesn't make enough sense. I don't understand it. Maybe I'm too thick. But I've done a lot of digging and I don't get it. So done. Mm. And I got a lot of people asking, why did you pull it? And I had to be really diplomatic because you don't want to be sued for defamation. Yeah, of course, yeah. And I don't know who's behind Lannister. I, I don't know who I'm going to be annoying. Yeah, so yeah. I, was, I was trying to be diplomatic about it, but I, I just physically didn't understand what's going on. But I, So I pulled that deal, but it was basically um, the fee was shares. Oh, is it? Mm. Okay. So you got shares in a in business. business yeah. And the way they structure, structured it, they, they gave you kind of Monzo's trajectory, how they've how they got the rose to the valuation they were at at the time and yeah. what those shares, if you know, if Lannister copied the same same trajectory, what your shares would be worth. And I think my shares that we, we kind of agreed on would have been worth, I don't know, Cora Mill, something like that. Okay, that's, that's still... If, if it had followed the trajectory it, yeah, of Monzo. Of, of Monzo yeah. There was a lot of ifs yeah. and then and buts and yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to be fair, I don't even know where the company stands today. So I don't even know what it would what it would look like. I don't know, and I'm not having a go at them. I wish them all the best. Do whatever. Yeah. Um, I was just like, it just doesn't make enough. I can't, I can't sit there and justify it to someone. I can't fully have a rock solid. This is why I did it. This is why I did it. Mm. Yeah. So, Tom, Crep Chief Notify. Yeah. Obviously, we've had the boys on the channel. Yeah. Will, uh, Milo. Oh, do you know what? There's too many of them to name. Crept you notified, let's call yeah, it like that. Boys, yeah. lads, lads. Great, great lads. Yeah. yeah. Love them to bits up in Manchester. Whenever I go to Manchester, I'll go and see them. Yeah, they're chaos. I've heard their side of the story of, you know, how they started, how they got the name of you. I want to talk, I'll ask you something here. So yeah. they approached you with the intention of buying the account, Crept yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. What was your first thoughts? So my first thoughts, it, it started, I was like in my city job, sitting in a, in a room full of people that, uh, I had no interest in talking to, thinking I can't just be doing this for the rest of my life. I things are going out all right on the outside, but I want more. I want to make more money. Yeah. And there were these resellers like flipping trainers and Yeezy three fifties. I think had just come out. So yeah. Turtle doves and all that. Yeah. Kind of. And reselling obviously existed before the Yeezys, but Yeezy thing was the kind of thing that first really Snowballed hit home because yeah. I was like two and a half grand for a pair of yeah pieces T of foam. Taking the piss, yeah. Um, so I started the Crep Chief business with um, my friend Aaron, who I'm still in business with across a load of different things. We talk every day. Um, you win uh, Emoji Fresh with him as well. Emoji right? Fresh, yeah, Mr. AP yep. on Instagram, yep. great guy. Due um, to get him on tune as well. Yeah, he's yeah. he's a wicked guy. He's yeah, really really cool, uh, and he's one of the few people that I've known for that long that has never wronged me. He's always done exactly what he said he was going to do. He's completely trustworthy in this day and age. Like, I've just. You need I meet that. so many people that are just out for something and I can't trust and he's he's just mega. Anyway, so we start that business together and he builds websites. So he built the website for it. And we had a system whereby we would, we had an, uh, some 18 year old young lad working for us that knew the trainer market inside out. He was on all, all the Facebook things that were going on. And he knew what the buy price of these trainers were on the resale market and what yep. the flip price was that you could sell to what you could you know, make. footballers and punters and whatever that would just go on. So anyway, cut long story short, we started that Crep Chief business, which is basically just, if someone would go on the website and they'd see 200 pairs of the most popular trainers on there at varying prices. We'd adjust the prices almost on a daily basis. Well, this young lad would, and Aaron would be on the website stuff, and I would just be doing the punting. Yeah. And we launched it on Boxing Day 2018. I think it was 2018, Boxing Day. And we did 140 grand's worth of business in the first day. In the first day. And we then had to buy 140 old grand's worth of trainers. We had to source these trainers, this young lad did. Yeah. But what we had was Shopify. They were like, right, this new business has started, 140 grand's flowing through it in the first few hours. Yes. We didn't know these guys from Adam two weeks ago, and now suddenly 140 grand. They held our money. Hmm. And we never held stock. It what was do you think? There was some sort of dodgy thing going on. These, these, a lot of these places, they're on algorithms. It's automated. Yeah, There's yeah, no yeah. thought process. Yeah. It's just limit reach, lock it in. Yeah. So we had our funds frozen. A lot of people that paid for trainers. This is Boxing Day. I mean, trying to chill out a little bit. Yeah. We had the old M launch five days later. That not going according to plan. Yeah. Not in a great place. Um... And the, these these sods, they locked our money and shot. I think it was Shopify, or Stripe, or one of these one of these bloody platforms. Anyway, cut long story short, the that, that kind of consignment, um, 
that kind of business model didn't work because what they wanted to see, they wanted to see that we'd bought stock and then we'd sold it. Not we'd got a load of money and then we were buying stuff with people's money. Yeah. Which is okay to do. That works. It's, it's just sourcing. Like, yeah, of course, yeah. It's absolutely fine. The stock is there. You just don't own it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, we realized that that was a very stressful way to do things. Everyone got their money back like, almost immediately. That, we, that must we, have been a very stressful time. Wasn't much fun. Yeah. Uh, Aaron and I had no fun. Um, and there was quite a public falling out with someone that was public online at the time um, that did his best on the day it launched as well to ruin that business because we had fallen out. I haven't spoken to him in years. I mean, I'm sure it's fine now. Any um, name drops? No. No? Like, I can't be bothered with it all again. I <laughs> honestly can't be bothered. Um, I don't think he'd be bothered either. Any off camera? I'll tell you, yeah, I'll tell you when the cameras are properly off. <laughs> yeah. um, but no bad blood there. But he, for whatever reason, we fell out, but he started, and he had a bit of a following. He started saying on the same day as well, oh, they're selling fake trainers just to ruin the business. So yeah, it was a, a cluster F-U-C-K. And yeah, that one didn't go particularly well. But what we had, we, we had a resale brand. Can we hear that or not? There's some Probably chaos downstairs. A little bit, a little bit. Should be, should be all right. Sorry, we can't tell them to shut up. They'll tell us to get out. <laughs> yeah. um, so effectively, we had this resale brand. We had about 10, 12,000 followers on this Instagram account of people that wanted to buy trainers at infl inflated prices and couldn't be bothered to go and source them themselves. They just wanted the trainers there and then. And we realized that our model didn't work. We didn't want to buy stock. We didn't want to sink 300 grand into a load of stock. Yeah, of course. Um, we thought, well, we've got this Instagram account. Let's just chill and just hold fire. But what we had done by launching that business, we made such a, a name in that kind of world. You're in the resale world. You couldn't like avoid what we'd done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, we'd just come out of nowhere. Uh, and a short time later, the, the boys, the Crep Chief boys, they approached me and they said, can we buy your Instagram account? And Aaron and I weren't doing anything. We just still had it. We were like, we How can't be bothered with this business. Uh, it was probably 10, 12,000, okay. maybe 15,000. Still good, yeah. I mean, how many customers do you need in your business a year when yeah. you're making a couple hundred quid on a pair of trainers? You don't need 20,000 customers in a year. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. need 500. Yeah. Um, so 10 to 15,000 followers is more than enough. So anyway, they gave us pff, five grand for the account, two grand, grand. I, don't, I, can't, I genuinely can't remember. Yeah. But when I met them to do the transfer, I said, right, tell me more about how these trainers are sourced. Because we didn't really ask the, our young lad, who's useless as well. We got rid of him. Um, we didn't really ask him how we were sourcing all this stuff. He was like, oh, Facebook or I'm in WhatsApp groups or whatever. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that makes a bit of sense. But I, was, I said, drill into it. How, how can you confidently say you can source anything for anyone? And they said, oh, there's these things called cooking groups. They're on Facebook. They're on WhatsApp. Basically, you'll have 20, 30 people in a group. Um, and you'll all just get hold of stuff and, and just churn it and basically just market make within these things. Yeah. And I said, well, hang about. Like, can't we just charge people a monthly fee and basically give people the information to then make money with? Yeah. And they were like, yeah, well, no, one, no one's done that. And I was like, yeah, let's just try and chuck 10,000 people in, paying £30 a month, but make sure they're getting the best quality Service information they can get. and cut out that guesswork, that risk, yeah. and the time element, and just ping notifications to people's yeah, straight I mean, to people's phones. I've used it, and it's so simple and so easy to make money. I mean, I've, I'll be honest, I've turned a couple of PS5s, a couple of Xboxes. Perfect. Absolutely it's perfect. It's easy. And the amount of people I go, well, they say, oh, yeah, it was that simple. Everyone would be doing it. And in my head, I think everyone should be doing it. If you've got time and you sit and watch four hours of TV every single night and you can tell me what's happening concurrently in four different TV series, yeah. you have too much time on your hands and you should never be moaning about not making enough money. You should yeah. never be moaning about your bills and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. within reason, obviously, you know, people are going to take that the wrong yeah. way and probably go for me there, but... But still, if you've got the time to if watch on TV... sat watching TV for hours four every hours night. every yeah. single night, you could easily you make two to three grand a month extra. Easy peasy. And, and the amount of people that are out there that think one income's enough and they think that their one income should always wipe out their outgoings and give them disposal on top. Mm -hmm. The fact that it has been for, for however long I can remember, for most people, is just pure luck. I've always thought on a basis, have as many incomes as possible. Um... And you're probably all right, but I think now we're realizing that one income isn't necessarily enough. Job security isn't necessarily a thing. If you've got, even if you're on PAYE, yeah. you're not do, even doing contract work, um, and it is it is genuinely that easy. And I think it's quite a hard sell because it is so simple. Yeah, there's not much to explain other than 
I just buy what you're told to buy and sell yeah. it for a profit. That's I, literally it. I think the thing that makes it difficult nowadays to market it like that, to, as, as simple as it is, I think the thing that makes it difficult is things outside of the business. When you see people on Instagram flexing this and that, living mm. the rich life and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah very definitely. And, and that plays a part into how people perceive, uh, perceive the business. We've gone through an era of, you know, f- Forex people on their MacBooks and their, and their water villas yeah, 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 in yeah. Maldives <laughs> that they've gone to the night. And they've gone there for the night, yeah, yeah, got yeah. a year's worth of content and gone home again. Yeah. Um, we've gone through a whole phase of that where people seem to be being flashy online are instantly treated with distrust. And I actually think nine times out of 10, that's probably, you're probably yeah, yeah. on the money yeah. for distrusting people that are, yeah. are showing off excessively. But myself, obviously excluded from that. But with the crutchy stuff, you know, you make 50 quid a day out of it. It's not that glamorous. You know, you're packaging stuff, you're, you're sending it to a post office. Is that glamorous? Is that the Instagram flexing life? Are you in Dubai with 40 Lambos? No, you're not. Yeah. But you, you can you make 50 quid a day. You know, that's 1,500 pounds a month. Yeah. Happy days. And that's, mm. you know, your national average salary right there. Yeah, it's nothing, yeah. Um, but so- a lot of people think they're above doing that and they think oh I should be I should be churning thousands a day out of doing sod oil and actually you need to start at your 50 quid a day your 30 quid a day 20 quid on a deal here and there and everywhere Just and at the end of the month up. put it in a spreadsheet add it up yeah and then you never amazed. know where you get yeah and do three things like that that you're making 50 quid a day three times every single day you know I can't count but that's a lot of money <laughs> no, that's 50 yeah. quid times three whatever <laughs> yeah, the hell that yeah. is so you know four and a half grand a month yeah there you go yeah you got it before but me but if you think 150 quid a day it's a great day but it's you don't think my God, that's, you know, 60 grand a year, do you? This episode is brought to you by Sunomos. Now, if you don't already know about Sunomos, I don't know where you've been because they've got some of the nicest and most long lasting perfumes out there. One of my top favorites is the Arabian Nights oil and just a couple drops to keep you smelling fresh the whole day. Sunomos have got stores all over the UK. So chances are wherever you're watching this from, they've probably got a store near you. And if not, they're also online based as well. So there's no reason for you not to get it. And if you don't know what fragrance you want to get, I suggest going to the store, checking them all out and seeing which one you like the most. So get your Sunomos fix today and use the code CEOCAST15 for 15% off your purchase yeah no even if you're doing a couple like 500 pound a week like let's say that's a couple hundred grand it's a joke and you know where where is like the uk average salary right now i think it's about 30 35 grand Hmm. you know people haven't got much disposable income off of one job you know so you know let's just say you've got business inside and you've left your job around the average salary still that extra cash you could be making from ccn or yeah that extra cash goes a long way yeah 100% and in lockdown it was actually really really nice I got so many nice stories from people saying I've lost my job my partner's lost their job I'm on furlough we, like, we didn't have enough mm. and actually I had a few extra hours in the day I was curious I thought surely it's too good to be true I'm just going to have a look I'm going to sign up and if it's crap I'm going to abuse you but actually you know I've made 1500 quid this month you know we're going on holiday next week yeah happy days yeah. um, I'm not saying it's a miracle cue you're not going to be a millionaire from it uh, but actually if you do that with your spare time get your partner on it you know if, you, if you've if you got a partner that's you know on maternity leave or whatever you know obviously they're busy with a baby actually that's a terrible example but you know <laughs> you've got someone in your household that works sort of contract work and has lulls between things it's a great flexible way to make money yeah, or if you're just a relentless pig when you get home if you don't like sleeping or watching TV or eating dinner yeah. just work for the night yeah 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 that's the best way to do it yeah Tom, I'm going to ask you one last thing before you go, right? Go. Um, now, obviously, you document everything you do. Yeah. You've got your, you document the watches that you have, you document the cars that you have. Mm. And there's one problem. I've, I've obviously got my car. You've seen it outside, bright yellow. Don't know why I've done it bright yellow. Um, it's good. I like it. I appreciate that. But there's one problem with it. I park it on a driveway. So people now recognize the driveway, recognize where I live. So now I've had to start parking the car elsewhere. Right. Yeah. So my question to you is, we live in a dangerous world, so how do you manage it? You know, your your cars, everyone knows your cars. Yeah. yeah if they see the SLS, yeah. they've seen the plate, they're, oh, that's TG. Yep. If it's the wrong person seen it, that's TG. He might be wearing an AP. He might be having this. He might have a I lot of it. cash on I get, him. I get followed. I, 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 see, I see it. Uh, I've been relatively lucky so far. But the driveway thing, I was on top of that years ago, even before I started being, yeah. doing anything even vaguely flashy online. Um, you know, my cars, I don't even store my cars anywhere near where I live. Yeah. What I actually drive, where I actually am, my daily driver, no one has ever seen. For about six years, no one has ever seen where I actually drive. Like today, I'm in the SLS, great. You know, and, and it goes back to like a car storage unit. Yeah. You know, and then I'll get an Uber. Mm. 
or other taxi app. See, the first time I had come across that issue is someone had DM'd me a picture of my car in my driveway. Yeah, I, and, and I'll get I was get like, it. oh shit. <laughs> Parked up, if I leave the SLS in town, yeah. I will see it. Yeah, you probably get loads of story tags. Yeah, TG, all, TG, all TG. the time. But yeah. what happens in this day and age as well, something else to be paranoid about now, if you park that car in Sainsbury's, Tesco, whatever it is, people can buy a tracker off yeah. eBay or... Amazon. Even Apple Air Tags, that was a the thing. They will let you know now. If yeah, now you. they will. Yeah, but in the beginning, no but it doesn't one help you. Yeah. By the time it's told you it's with you, yeah. you've gone and chucked it under, like outside your house yeah. or in your, in your garage at your house. You've yeah. had it. Just, so nothing I've ever put online is ever where I live, yeah. and, and that has been the case for, for actually it's even since the LDNM days. I'll give you a quick funny story with the Apple Air Tags. Uh, right, one of my uh, friends, he's got a E60 M5 old thing. Yeah, mm. engine went, gave it to BMW for warranty work. So the engine's not working. So he's hitting an Apple Air tag in the car, like in the back seat somewhere where no one can find it, right? Mm. He's given the car to BMW. The car's not working. Obviously, he's given it on a tow truck, whatever. They've had it for a couple of months. Air tag's perfectly fine. Air tag starts moving now and everything for a good month or so. In the car, literally, and he's... Uh, I don't know what, how much I could say on camera. Um, Go for it. But he's basically seen the M5 parked at someone's house overnight it turns out that was the service manager's house but he used to, he called him in the morning saying how's the m5 coming along uh yes we're just waiting for the engine from germany uh etc oh. blah, blah 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 what was the what was the name of the dealership uh, it was it was around birmingham which explains <laughs> i'm not saying anything <laughs> not saying but, a word yeah it, it was it's crazy and i was just like yeah but that's crazy Air tags. but yeah. that technology now has come so far so fast you can get got with that stuff and yeah. i'm just super conscious of that um but yeah, I'll, I'll happily park miles away from like I don't even live in one place. Yeah. I'm just kind of across. Yeah, it's a Everything. it's a my living situation is a mess. Mm. I don't even understand it, so I'm kind of yeah, I am quite quite conscious in that respect though. Yeah, but you see it all you the time. People say, "Morning, everyone, look at my watch." As I say, I don't have watches in my house. Yeah. I just I don't have anything of value anywhere I sleep, anywhere I live. It's all in bonded storage because there's just no point. I wouldn't be able to sleep having anything of value with me. Yeah. But so many people, they're like, morning, everyone. Here's my AP. Here's the view from my window. Here's my car. And the worst part is it's all live story as well. Uh, what is wrong then. with you? Like today, the stories will go out tomorrow. Yeah. I never post where I am. Yeah, exactly. You can't, can't afford to Unless do it. Unless I have to do a live event. Yeah. And I actually have to be somewhere. In which case, you know, I'll get Addison Lee in and out or something like that. And you won't and even just, take a watch with you. And, I, and uh, definitely not be a watch <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, yeah, you do have to be really careful of that. But you, you hear people getting hit the whole time. And it's a horrible, horrible environment, particularly London. Have you had any scary city. scenarios like that? Like, I, um, I know you said people have followed you, but have you had anything close to it? Um, I haven't, but I think, I guess I am a target. But once you get to know me, you realize that I'm actually like not really a target. There's not yeah. really anything really worth having. Yeah. All my stuff and going back to the, like, the tax side of things as well. All my stuff is business assets. So again, from a tax perspective, you can't have them at personal address because then you start getting personal yeah. use and all this kind of sort of stuff from the from revenue, which is totally fair. So I'm quite different in that I don't really, I'm not really, I guess I don't really have the life that potentially people think I have. I think people think I live in this massive house with 15 cars underground and, and, and a whole room in, full in a of, pile watches. of watches and yeah. cash and diamonds yeah. and whatever, when realistically I don't, but for the best, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I literally wouldn't be able to sleep. <laughs> you they're, can live like that on your private island. They're stores of values <laughs> and they're, they're business assets. They're just kind of, yeah. they can stay away, to yeah. be fair. Right. Have I waffled on for too long? No, no, I'm, I'm just going to see if I've everything. asked you um, the, 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 I think I've pretty much asked all my questions going over. All I've got some bollard chat if you want it. Go on then. Do you want some bollard chat? Everyone yeah. likes bollard chat. Yeah, go on. Um, awesome. I was just going to say one of the recent businesses that I'm most excited about is a business called Intellipost. We basically got this encrypted app, which is like all painted in and whatnot. Um, Self-raising bollards, like security bollards, like massive. So it's almost like how people like, you know, when I see it in movies and stuff, people drive up to the house and the gates open with like the yeah. thing in the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly like that. So you don't need to get out because most bollards are like gas assisted, but you have to get out of your running car, yeah. go and pull the bollard down, by which point some, Someone's some idiot's in your car. got in your X5 and disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we've got that. We spent years developing it. Um, we've just got secured by design um, accreditation on it. Mm. And they're sick because you can actually raise and lower your bollard from like anywhere in the world. So you say you've got a second place. Yeah. Um, 
and you see someone messing around, your car's on the drive and the bollard's not up. You can put it up. You can say, I don't like the look of you and they'll just see the bollard go up. Yeah. So has this launched? And you can be on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sick. We, we kind of soft launched it just to see how, how? Just see how it's kind of gone yeah. and the uptake without any marketing at all. Yeah. We've put 500 in the ground already. Yeah. Uh, they're 1,600 quid each. Um, they're on Klarna now as well, so people can pay in That's installments. You know, sixteen hundred bad is not bad at all. They're especially, really, really reasonable. If you look at the price of bollards, they are mental expensive, yeah, especially gas assisted ones. N- not even just that. I mean, if people who have you know very nice cars, I'd get it for my car. Hmm. Um, you know, I wouldn't want like a risk of anyone trying to get that. I'll do your deal, mate. Five grand. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? I'll sponsor a video for it. <laughs> We'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah. 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 But no, I'd hundred percent have that set technology. You know. So what? You could. I could literally order it. Dig a hole out in the driver. So or? installation's uh, part of it. You can get it installed as well. Oh, and it doesn't it? take any special. You don't need like a certain type of um, rock or anything on your drive. Just as long as there's no like gas things directly below or electricity directly below where you or the yeah. water table or something. I don't. I'm not a technical guy. Yeah. Um, but they're very easy to install. We've got installers that go around do it nationwide within a week. Um, but they're really cool. And and similar to when you've got like a high value safe, you know when uh, you can put it on a time lock. So if someone comes in your house and says put that bollard down mate give me your car gun to your face it's on a time lock you can yeah. lock it for eight hours you can just like there's the app crack on how do you scale that then you know being with the fact that if you are providing installation right yeah and you're you know the bigger picture obviously is to be international and everything like that yeah. how do you manage all of that how do you scale that so we've that got uh, a few different partners in the UK that we will be working with. We had an exclusive uh, distribution agreement with with the biggest kind of bollard installer in the UK, um, but we're going to open it out. Uh, we're going to change things up as of as of early twenty three. Mm. Uh, work with some cool people in the UK that do garage renovations and construction. Get them into new developments as well. So we've got some good. Uh, good contacts in, in the construction industry. Uh, so the new build apartment blocks, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then commercial premises as well. The, the applications for them are actually huge and you can also use them to, to stop people parking in your parking space. Yeah, that's good. So again, monetizing parking spaces. And the pe- it's UK steel, UK produced. We can make one at a time. We can make them to order. So it's a very scalable That's scalable very good business. for you as well. The margins are fantastic. You can really incentivize suppliers, distributors. Yeah. Um, I think that might be the big one. I mean, just relating it to when you said storage, you said steals from abroad, right? Yep, so it's you not anymore. Yeah. We've, we've now brought that back on board with the, the guys that are making the, the bollards. The bollards. And they've got amazing facilities. Yeah. They can powder coat the storage unit. So that's yeah. now going to be live. So you never sure have to well. ever worry about another pandemic happening and export prices going through the roof. Oh, it was a nightmare. Container price. I mean, my, so, Yeah, my mate's got a business in Birmingham. He gets containers all day long. It went from three grand to 18 grand for yeah, a container. Yeah, exactly that. It, yeah. it wasn't just, oh, we're going to have to charge customers a little bit more. It's, it's we will be selling these things at a thousand pound loss. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just stupid. Yeah. Um, but that's no longer the case. We've got some great people on board and my business partner on the, the Bollard side, um, we've been dealing with each other for years and he came to me with this great idea. I think it was COVID mm-hmm. and he said, I've got this great idea. I'm doing kind of crowdfunding for it um how much can i pay you to do some videos and i said i absolutely love the idea it's completely aligned with my audience car crime's going ballistic it's only going to get worse yeah, especially throughout covid because yeah. you know people were losing the jobs and everything yeah and then the robbers were just getting worse and worse yeah yeah yeah, Crazy. yeah i mean i don't know what that jump between i've got my p45 i'm gonna go and nick some family's <laughs> car and tie them up in the house so there's Okay, I'm not jump. saying that jump specifically I'm just saying like but you know it became a lot no, more definitely. apparent yeah, yeah yeah no I, I agree with you and, and people are tying the two together and I think there is still a gulf I think you know the, yeah. your average bloke that's lost their job in a whatever it is that yeah, doing, yeah. in accounts in like an IT department or something like that yeah. it's not going to go and stick no no no, no he's gun. not he's not no I think yeah <laughs> anyway um, so I, I said let's work together let, let me come in on the business I'm not going to charge you for anything yeah um, I can see huge growth in this and yeah, it's, it's just been going crazy. So we've just done our 500th with no marketing, really, apart from me mentioning it a couple of times. Mm. Um, so when you say that's the one, what do you mean by that? I think Is that, that the one, one that's going to get you to that private island and ghost? We've got some really nice ideas with where the product's going down the line. Our core product will remain the same, but I think that'll be the one that potentially in a few years or even a year, we could get a pretty aggressive valuation on it mm. and it'll be a really nice business for someone to buy okay so really you plan nice. to sell that in the future and there's, some, there's some clever tech stuff that actually is built into that there's a great brand um yeah i'm really excited about that one 
yeah. and it's going to be linked with the storage business now as well. So I think as a pair, we've got the same marketing guy that's on my other companies in there as well. We've created some great assets and yeah, I think it'll go crazy. That's sick, man. Anything else you've got coming up? I actually can't remember off the top of my head. I'm sure <laughs> I've, I'm sure there's some harebrained I, nonsense coming. I wrote down some businesses that, you know, I watched a video last night and I watched, I watched the LD&M, we've covered, CCN covered, Grow Watch Club covered. Yeah. Watch protection company have we covered? Yeah, watch that? protect. Yeah, the watch yeah. protect. Um, yeah, I, I, with a really, really cool young lad that's in that. I think, I think he's Birmingham based. Yeah, uh, he'd be a good one to get on the, on the, on the show. Yeah, he's yeah, really cool. cool. Um, so that's essentially a PPF op for. Uh, how do you explain it to people who don't even know about it's, cars? It's protective film or liquid for your watch. So basically, it's an invisible barrier. Mm on your watch this one's got liquid on at the moment oh, has it, which yeah? obviously is not liquid anymore yeah. but it just kind of dries on there which means it doesn't get scratched yeah that's what I need just rub it off that's what I need because I was looking at my watch and yeah. if you look at that you could just see a few scratches there so that wouldn't be the case so with- class specifically is, I would say is a great place to put it but some people coat that whole watch and particularly I mean on these you've got the polished yeah, bezel yeah, yeah. part yeah. and Cartier's the whole front face is polished, it's polished yeah. um, Patek's you know, it's not for everyone. Like P- PPF on cars, it's basically just invisible cling film yeah. that you can key someone's car and then just peel off the film and it's fresh on the... You know, like when you get a new TV yeah. and you've got that film that <laughs> yeah, comes yeah, off yeah, yeah. and you leave it on there for as long as you can and then you peel it off three months <laughs> After, later yeah. and it's like you've got a new TV again. <laughs> yeah. It's like that for watches and we were kind of the first people to do to that do it, yeah. in the UK and like really push it hard. Um, I've not done as much as I wanted to with that business. Um, we've been going through numerous rounds of product tweaks as well, um, but we're now slowly starting to get into into distributors and... And kind of, you know, when you go to Foot Locker or mm-hmm. Foot Asylum or whatever it is, JD Sports, and you get your new trainers to the desk. Chaos. I'm online at work. <laughs> oh, sure. Make sure, make sure I'm not being harassed. Um, you know, when you get to the desk and you've got like uh, Crep, Crep Protect. Protect or whatever, yep. we we're basically positioning this product like that. So your watches are Switzerland, your Fraser Hearts, your okay. blah blah blah, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Um, for people that not necessarily they have the watch 20 years, they're not going to have it on for 20 years. But if you can have this thing on your on your watch the first year two years or just refresh it each time it's just going to keep your watch fresh yeah some people yeah. like battering their watches they like just having it smashing it down like you a badge of honor it's yeah, dented yeah, yeah, yeah. but some people like really looking after their stuff and the it's best for them is, yeah protect it, it like that. Yeah. so watch protect anything else what, what else have i forgotten here i've got on here so that was watch protect classic giveaways are done hi pooch Hi Pooch, yeah, so we took the website offline over summer because no one wants to buy a jacket for their dog in the summer. This is basically um, sort of parody hype clothing for dogs. So like Supreme, we've got um, jackets that say Pupreme on them. North Face, it says Dog Face. Um, it's for your crowd that, well, has a dog and it gets cold. That's it. That's, mm, that's yeah. the use case. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and yeah, it's kind of, it's cool stuff. We're putting that back online. I think we should do it this week because it's getting cold. Yeah, 100%, um, yeah. We've got tens of thousands of pounds worth of stock that I've paid for so are my girlfriend's oh so you've got the stock there and my girlfriend's supposed to be running it yeah so uh, that's reminded me I'm going to give her a kick and say (laughs) get back on with it Uh, Aaron though Mr. AP he runs the site again on that so you can see there's a common theme developing people that I trust and people that are great we all just work together again that's not big business though yeah but it's it's Marginal wins. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Aaron has a company called Watch It Shine, right? Or he has a company called Watch It Shine, which is a really cool um, watch sort of restoration box. You've got everything in there, like ref- I believe there's like refinishing pad, um, cleaning kit, everything. Okay, like that. so it's not similar to uh, or not the same as Watch Protect. Watch Protect's designed to protect it in the first place, and, and Watch It Shine is to clean it. Essentially, they're kind of same target market, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're not. They're completely separate products. They don't compete with each other. Yeah, at fair. All. And then, like you mentioned with with your missus there, you've got We Are Kai. Yes, I've got I've got a share in that business. Although what I know about bikinis, you could write on the back of a stamp. <laughs> I obviously have a, uh, a an interest in bikinis because yeah. I, I'm you know wide up that way and I'm not blind. So you know, bikini business is obviously of, of great interest. But um, she's been a swimwear and, and uh, lingerie model for ten plus years commercially. Mm-hmm. She, she studied fashion. She knows how to do you know all those mad like fashion drawings that people yeah, do. Yeah, and they yeah. Draw them on mannequins and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, she yeah, studied yeah. all of that, so she just punts out like a madness at home. That business is um, it's sustainable. It's truly from the ground up. She designs everything. She's completely involved with the manufacturing. I'm really really proud of her for that. It's it's really really cool. Um, it's not just a copy and paste job of Alibaba like a lot of these swimwear companies. Yeah, they, they just buy any old any old poo and just white label it and they just and they just yeah. punt it it'd be a lot it'd be a lot easier for her the margins would be a lot better and it'd be a much better business um, but, but she really a, cares about her business yeah. and um, it's going really well it's 
doing a lot better than I thought it would. And that's not doing her down. I thought it'd do all right, but it's, you know, she's getting quite a few orders every day. So really proud of her for that. That's good. That's good. Mm. Uh, da, 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 da. You've got a couple of properties, which I believe you mentioned. Um, yeah, I do some rental stuff. I hate all of it. I mean, the cottage I bought you? in the Cotswolds. Yeah, cottage I bought in the Cotswolds. I originally bought that and I've kind of divided it up now. So I've got kind of car storage there and I can also Airbnb it. But when I bought that, I bought that cottage right at the start of the pandemic when everyone was like sort of taking stock and thinking, ah. Mm, yeah. And I thought, I'm going to pounce. I'm going to buy a place out of London because... I suspect people might leave London, yeah, yeah, which has yeah. happened, thank yeah. God. Uh, and I bought the Crow GT at the same time. I just pounced. I was like, I'm in. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now. Um, and on paper, you know, the pair of those made me you know, about one and a half mil. Correct me if I'm wrong in saying, but the same time you got the Crow GT, you left your job, right? I did. Crow GT, left my job and bought a house at the same time. It was really just balls out the bath, like... Yeah, <laughs> suicide bomb. Just Out Corins must have been a lot, and it was scary. You know, it was really, really back scary. Their income. Yeah, have you what? ever had any fear of, you know, I can imagine your monthly expenses. Yeah, just for the cars alone, are in excess of. Have a guess at, at the peak. Peak idiot TGE. Have a guess like what was going out and we're, we're at the peak, yeah. holistically on cars. So your storage, your, your insurance, like everything surrounding cars, fuel, tax, insurance, whatever, and your monthly payments. At the peak, was, deposits. Was the Carrera GT in there with the peak? Yeah. Thereabouts. I want to say something like hundred grand a month. Hundred grand a month. Yeah. You've done me a huge, uh, a huge honour there by. Was thinking that I could I could get away with that. No, oh. no, no, no. That would have sunk me. Hundred a month hundred a month going out on cars alone. No, that, no, no, sorry, That would have got rid of me pretty no, quickly. Because I'm 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 thinking of the value of the Porsche Carrera GT today. Yeah. Obviously you didn't get it as that, did no, you? No, no, no. What, okay. what, what 50. I pay for it? Uh not even. Month just pure monthlies. Yeah. Um minus the deposits. But bearing in mind I was probably buying a car maybe once a month. So I'd need to find a big chunk for for each time that yeah, the car yeah. came in. Um, but if you're just talking about strictly monthly, it's about 30, 30 a month. Yeah. My car insurance isn't that bad. I think it was like 18 grand for the year, which if you think about it, it's not that bad. But actually, they are still taking taking the mick because I can only drive one at a time. It doesn't matter how many I've got. Yeah. If they're stored securely, you can only be in one car at a time. Do you ever think, like, what's the point of having all these cars? Yeah, all the time. I d- it's not that I hate them. Yeah. But I'm really pleased that I've done it now because... When I'm older, and I'm old now, but when I'm a bit older and I see a guy in a nice car, a guy with a car collection, I'm no longer going to be jealous. I'm no longer going to think, I wish that was me. Because I'll now look at it and think, that was me. I've done that. And it was a pain in the ass. Mm. Money aside, it's a pain in the ass. Like that SLS now, it it needs a service. It's bleating that it needs a service. It needs a service... 10 days ago I haven't driven it so it's fine to, to drive today and it's going for service in two days time yeah. got to do a uh, campaign with IWC with it yep. the same day and then it goes for service that afternoon um, but you know your MOTs your tax there's always at least and my audience love pointing it out there's always at least one of my cars that I've forgotten to tax and then I get a fine <laughs> or I've forgotten to MOT it because they're I all dotted around I can imagine a lot, a lot of admin work for, for your cars it's, it's a headache so I've got rid of five, six cars recently yeah have you announced that you got rid of them as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. What uh, cars? These guys actually, I bought my test off of them yeah. about 14 months ago and I sold it within four hours. Of, of getting it? Of selling, um, of them taking it back. They put it on their website and it was gone within four hours. They got oh. rid of it straight away. Bloody hell. And yeah, I was about 30 up in a year. How many cars you got now? I'm still at about eight. Oh, that's not too bad. But then uh, I don't have the huge punchy stuff that I used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've still got the Crow GT, but other than that, it's like SLS, GT3 so RS, point, that kind of thing. Did you, you have an SV and an F12 t- at the same time? Oh, uh, yeah. I had an SV and an F12 at the same time. No. At one point, I had SV, F12, and a Pista at the same time. Yeah, that's that's crazy. And then I had <laughs> 458, F12, and a Pista at the same time. What was the peak value of your car? collection i don't know because the Carrera gt's kind of doubled or tripled over the past Car- couple of years it's Carrera gt has had what about like when you had all these cars together at one point because Carrera gt you got fairly recently about tw- two years ago three years ago right start of covid 2020 yeah, yeah. so like march 2020 um 
I say it's always been around a couple of million quid, to be fair. Yeah, that's crazy. That's in, in, in mainly debt at huge interest rates. So my, my original question was, have you ever had any scary, not scary times, but thoughts of, oh, if I, this doesn't go well, I am going seriously bankrupt or something like that? I felt a few times, Tom, you've done it. You've gone under the waves and you're not coming back this time. I've never gone bankrupt. I've never been close, to be fair. Um, I've always got away with it. Um, but when I bought my first apartment in London, I was ground zero and then some below that. Uh, I had no money at all. I still had my Aventador S because I refused to sell it. <laughs> well, I, when I went through the mortgage process, I had an Aventador S and my mortgage broker at the time, this was before I had a billion cars, I had an Aventador S and maybe a Defender or something. And I was saying to my mortgage broker, I've got an Aventador S, I've got about a quarter of a million pounds worth of car finance. And he said, yeah, you'll have to settle that. You'll have to sell the car before you get the house. They're not going to approve the mortgage if you've still got this, this yeah, bloody yeah, Lamborghini. Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, and that point, I let my Performante go to Tony okay. Gravelwood. Yep. And I kept my Aventador S. And I kept it throughout the whole process. And then we got to exchange. No one said anything. I still had my Aventador S. And I thought, this is good. And I didn't need the 30, 40 grand deposit that I had in the car to get my deposit <laughs> together. I had enough money for that, just. Yeah, yeah. And I factored it in. I was just in. And I didn't need to sell the car. And I was yeah. being stubborn. Because I've always been all right income-wise, but in terms of big lump sums, that's always been the thing that, that gets yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. So I was happy with the monthlies and the mortgage and the rents the rest together. And then it got to completion. And I expected them to go, ah, funds aren't going across. Because they do a, what's called like a hunter search. Yeah. Prior to completion, they do a deep dive in a credit before yeah and they'll see what's on your credit file and during the process it wasn't a condition on my mortgage offer that the event address had to go even though i've been told before that it should have gone it never did um and it never appeared so i never got rid of the event address and i got my apartment with event address but i had no money i remember i was doing a boys trip to the south of france you know two juggernauts full of cars remember when we used to go to the south of france yeah, yeah, and do yeah. all those road trips yeah. um and the transport they wanted i don't know 10 grand 15 grand, whatever it was, to hire two massive lorries yeah. south of France. Two people stay down there with them and then drive them all back. Between sort of 15 of us, it was fine. Um, but what I did, I got everyone's money off them because I was paying the transport company. Um, and I'd overshot the runway in terms of what I needed for my house. And the two coincided between getting 15 grand off my group of mates. And they know I did this. So um, there's, there's nothing private here. I'm not exposing myself. But I used that 15 grand to, to chuck into my deposit like last second to get my house across the line. And then like a week later, I had to go meet the transport company and give them their money. And I literally, I didn't really have it all. So I was like, lads, I'm going to have to pay you in like three days. I'm so sorry. They were all right with it because it was before the job finished. So they didn't yeah, really yeah. care. But I basically had to tell all the boys on the WhatsApp group that I just like Ponzi schemed their money. That's, uh, no, you, you, I was a ground on, zero. I had nothing. Yeah. Like literally, I completely overdone it. Um, but I was still earning, so I thought, you know what? I don't have any this week, but I'll have some next week. Money's still coming in. Things haven't crashed. So as long as I think, uh, yeah, I, I try not to get too stressed over it. Money's money. As long as someone doesn't kill my girlfriend or kill my dogs, what's the worst going to happen? I'm like that as well sometimes. Or sometimes I spend a, a bit more than I should, knowing that I'm going to have more money next week yeah, or the week after anyway. You earn it. As long as you don't get into debt that you can't service you know what's coming in week yeah. in week, week out work out what the worst case scenario is and if you can't bury yourself out of the hole you put yourself in within six months in your worst case scenario then you have overcooked it mm. you've just you just got to keep an eye on that um but i think also when we were a bit younger james and i we, we lost our dad and we were oh, sorry, really Taylor. kind of conscious and sensible and we were kind of hoarders and we were very sensible about money. But when we went through that, we kind of changed our mindset a bit. We just thought, well, that's the worst that's ever going to really happen to us, losing a parent young and mm. seeing what they go through. Nothing's really going to be worse than that. If you run out of money, you run out of money. Borrow it off a mate, sell something. Uh, you know, As long as you're in that position where you can borrow from a mate or you can sell something, you've got assets, it's not worth damaging your health over. And you're experiencing a good life as well while you're here. You yeah, know. at least I can look back, you know, in 80 years time, if I, 80 years time, who do I think I am? I'm lucky to last another 10. I will look back and think, I've been there, I've done it, did I enjoy it? Probably not as much as it would have looked like I would. Um, you know, if you told 15 year old me what I'd have been, what I've been up to the past. Well, you live to tell the tale. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Catch up with you in 10 years, <laughs> see if I'm still around. Um, but yeah, I hope to be kind of semi-retired by the time I do kids and stuff. I don't want to do kids and all that sensible adult stuff before mm. I'm in a position where I can just rely on passive income and not do anything all day. People say, wouldn't you be bored if you retired? No. Would you not? 
I think most people are bored working. I'm bored and being bu- I'm I'm bored most of the time. Even though a lot of what I do looks fun, I'm bored, I'd say, 80, 90% of the time. Yeah, but and I'm busy. I'd rather be bored and not busy than bored and busy. You're busy. You've got, you've got many different businesses. So the day when you retire, yeah, let's just say everything's on the back foot. It's all running by itself. Mm. That's just you and your missus in the countryside with your dogs. 100 dogs, yeah. Would you not feel lost? No, not, not at, at all. all. I don't need to make money to feel alive i make money because i want to buy myself time in later life by the time i have kids and do all that stuff my aim is to go i work myself like a dog i've done all that stuff and now i can focus on just getting annoyed at my kids yeah, I, I might change my mind yeah. i might have them and think having a family is rubbish i want to go back to work <laughs> i might think that i don't know yeah. um but i don't i don't want to not have the choice i want to have the choice if i if i work or not um, I don't know if it's punchy saying I want to retire by 40 it's probably not going to happen I'm not giving it yeah. Billy Big Lick saying I'm going to retire by 40 I, I want to that's why I'm, and I think it's good to have a, a goal and I've overshot yeah. the runway twice already as I said so I think it will happen when it happens hopefully hopefully hopefully. well Tom I appreciate your time thank you thank mate. you for you know having this conversation no, it's a therapy us. session I've just it is it is just, mate we yeah. can keep going we can keep going um but on that note, I want to say thank you very much for coming on. Uh, thanks for your time. This Appreciate episode it. is sponsored by my good friends at Cinemask. It's actually my friend's brand, so I'm Here happy plugging go. them and everything. So this is for you, lovely perfume. Thank you so much, mate. Um, Cheers. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to send you out another one so you can give it to your missus as well. Thank you. Um, but other than that, you know the whole YouTube algorithm. How many likes do we need on this episode? Oh, I have no idea, but just bash the like button, leave a comment. Even if it's not very nice, it helps the algorithm. So yeah. do your worst. I've seen it all. Tell us what you think of Tom. Tell us what you thought of this episode. Tell us what you think of, um, here's a good one actually. If we get 100,000 likes, I'll give away a thousand pound cash for you to invest in your business or start your business. And Can I have a grand? Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. Thousand pound for everyone. That's it, thousand pound for not everyone. Not from me, it's coming out of his. <laughs> it's coming out of Crep Chief. <laughs> Could do. But no, uh, Tom, once again, I no, appreciate your time, mate. Right, thank you so much. Cool. Appreciate it. I'll catch you lot next Sunday on the next episode of CEO Cast. Peace. How's that, lad? Yeah, easy peasy. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. No, I appreciate your time, man. Honestly. It's not, do you know what? Doing what, you, what you're doing on that side is way harder than what I'm doing. What, I'm doing just, the interviewing? I'm just talking about stuff that I know has happened. Like, I don't, there's not any, I don't need any knowledge. I'm just talking about yeah. my life. So, <laughs> um, yeah, what you're doing is much harder to keep the conversation going and like lead it into things. So, yeah. hey, smash that. It's, I can do that. Yeah.